We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Olubi Johnson. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study in God's Word in Romans chapter 15. Last lesson we finished chapter 14. And basically the summary of the last uh, of that whole chapter was that if you're strong in faith, don't allow what you do, which may be lawful, but don't allow it to make others weak or to cause them to stumble or to cause them to be offended as much as it lies in you. In other words, you should have an attitude of love, patience, and forbearance to others who may not be as strong as you are yet. And I use the word yet because all of us are in a dynamic uh, condition of growth. They may not yet understand some of the things you understand. They may not yet be able to do some of the things you're doing. And when you're with them, you avoid saying or doing things or having an attitude that could make them offended, that could make them weak, uh, you know, uh, that could make them stumble. And uh, to do this, you need uh, what I have called, said over the years, and particularly in recent times, you need the wisdom of God. That's why wisdom is the principal part of love. To walk in love, you must be able to walk, you must have the wisdom that comes from the knowledge of God's word. Then you have to have compassion so that you can be touched with the feelings how God is feeling about the weaknesses of others. So you treat them like God would treat them, you know. And then, of course, you need to have the life and the power of God so that you can act, behave like God would behave. And that's why uh, 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 in this particular uh, context, we really need the wisdom of God. So, And there is no formula anybody can write for you. It's The Holy Spirit will have to teach you. In certain situations you get into, you just know that... Mm, I shouldn't do this here. You know, not that it's wrong. It's just that it can offend them. I gave some examples last week. I'm just reminded of another one now that I, God helped me with many years ago. This was, I don't know, maybe 10, 15. The years have all gone so fast. So it's difficult for me now sometimes to say this happened this particular time. But I don't think it's anything less than 15 years. I was in England. And uh, we, were, we were with some of our cousins, you know, we were visiting with them. And they went to this, uh, the wife used to go to this Anglican church, you know, in England. They call it Church of England. And um, they had a fellowship, you know, inside that church that had born-again Christians. She was a part of that fellowship. So... She approached me and said, Pastor, we'd like you to come and speak in our church. You know, and um, we'd like you to just, you know, come and share. Since I was with them, you know, they would use the opportunity. So um, I said, yes, you know, in that fellowship, she was Nigerian, but there were people. I think the head of the fellowship was an Indian, was an Indian man, born again, you know, and they had different nationalities and they had some English people there. So, uh, I agreed. You know, and um, uh, she spoke in tongues, but uh, quite a number of people in her fellowship didn't speak in tongues. And speaking in tongues was not really practiced in that church. So, when I got there, you know, as I prepared, and the Holy Spirit said, don't go and start talking about tongues here. Of course, tongues is fundamental. He said, but don't, don't do that here now. It will not, they will not receive it. He said, just give them a very simple faith message that, you know, what you say with your mouth will release power and it will co cause the mountain to move. Basically, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, you know, and that you, know, you should be very careful what you say so you don't say the wrong things and to get the power of God. And that's what I did by the grace and the mercy of God. I... I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't talk about tongues. Is it wrong to speak in tongues? Of course not. Is it wrong? But in that context, 
if I was going to get across to the people, I had to, you know, tell them about things that they can agree with me on. Then they will now move on to a higher level later on. And that's what, by the grace and the mercy of God, I did. And I can never forget it, you know, because after the service, a very old woman, she must have been in her 80s, maybe 90s, I don't know, an old, and she was English, old English woman, came up to me after the service. And, and she came to, you know, and, and said to me, she said, Pastor, I really enjoyed your message. It reminds me of the message of the old timers. You know, the kind of message we used to hear, you know, years ago. You know, they must let you come again. <laughs> you know, and I, I thanked her very graciously and everything. If I had gone there and said, I would have, you know, and all the people were blessed. You know, the pastor was, the, the vicar or whatever it was, you know, was blessed. The people in the fellowship were blessed. And they talked about, you know, me coming again and all of that. But, you know, I never had the opportunity. I, I came back to Nigeria and I don't think I had the opportunity to go back to that particular fellowship. What am I saying? Speaking in tongues is correct. And we must teach it. But you must do it, you know, in a way that the people will be able to receive it. You know, if I went there to start showing off how much knowledge I had, how I could speak in tongues and all of that, I would have offended them. Because the uh, majority of them, some of them, but majority of them were not at that level yet. And they would not receive it. It's Church of England, you know. There's everybody in Church of England that believes in speaking in tongues. And sadly and, 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 and regrettably, many of our Pentecostal brethren have done a lot of things to offend them. And they've heard so many bad reports. Now, oh, those people are, like, oh, you know, so you come and then you, you know, they just will, they'll just turn off, no matter whatever it is you want to say. However, you know, if, if you do it in love like I did, then with time, they will, they will come to it. I gave my testimony last week of a, a, a friend of mine. We're teaching in a school together. The same problem. He too came from a background where, where he they didn't, not that they didn't believe in tongues, but they believed that sort of sanctification came before it, you know. So for the first few months, I never, I never broached the subject. I never talked about it or said, you know, what he's doing was wrong, even though it was wrong, <laughs> you know. And, and I, just, I just was quiet about it. And there were other areas we could uh, fellowship on. And, 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 and then we became friends. And then we had a good relationship. That now opened the door for him to invite me to minister to the young uh, students. And uh, then and, and, and he allowed me now to talk about tongues. And everybody got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he too changed. But it took months. So it wasn't overnight. So we need the wisdom of God. To know how to walk in love. So let's now go to uh, chapter 15. Romans was actually a continuation of the same thought that's in chapter 14. We then, I didn't hear you, that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, don't do what you like. When you're weak, people whose faith may not be as strong as yours or who may be weak in one area or the other, you don't. You, you bear their infirmities. You don't just do what you like. You do what can, will be edifying, what they can relate to, to strengthen them and help them and gradually bring them up in their faith. And for this, we need, like I said, the wisdom of God. Then another thing we need here is humility. Many times, the Bible says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We want to show off our knowledge. We want to show that we know that these people don't know. You know, and, 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 and that way you offend people. You know, humility will allow you to let them, you know, m pretend, you know, as if you two don't know. Although you know, praise the Lord. You know what Paul said? He said that to the weak, I became as weak. You know, to them that are without uh, uh, the law, I became as without the law. To them, give me that scripture. It's not in my notes. Thank you. I've picked it already. To, to yeah aha no, uh -huh. go back to verse 20 you know uh, it says is it, uh, okay no 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 you're going too fast uh -huh. okay um it says unto the jews i became as a jew 
that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might get it under the law. There's another verse there. To the weak, where it says, to the weak I became as weak. Aha, uh -huh, yes, that's it. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am, watch this. I am made all things to all men, that I by all means save some. What's Paul saying? Exactly the same thing he's saying here. He's just using different words. We need wisdom and humility. You know, so that, you know, I'm not weak. But to the weak, I become as if I'm weak. I gave the example also last week that I, you know, went to a celestial church. You know, many, many years ago. This must be about 20, 25 years ago, if, if not more. You know, and uh, I, I took my shoes off. Of course, I, I, I know that taking your shoes off or not taking your shoes off is not important. But that's what they did there. And in order for me not to offend them, and, and, and the pastor asked me to come and preach, you know. So when I went there, I became as weak that I might gain them. And that's what happened to the glory of God. That pastor, you know, came for our prayer meetings here. We used to have these prayer seminars, you know. This was many, many years ago. People come from Kaduna and all of that, you know, people, our, all our partners, you know, because of our television program that was all over the nation. And we'll do like uh, one or two days teaching about prayer and showing them how to pray, how to grow, and how to pray in tongues and all that. You know, he, he, he left the celestial church and started and changed the church to become a Pentecostal church. And it's still a Pentecostal church today. Because we became as weak. So it's, it's, it, it, it's just wisdom. It's wisdom and humility. Ever say wisdom and humility. Uh, and if, uh, if we Pentecostals, charismatic word of faith guys need anything, we need those two things. Many times we're very brash. We don't have wisdom or we don't use it, you know, and we don't have humility. We want to show off our knowledge and show that we know more than them, you know. That's why by the grace and the mercy of God, over the years, I have uh, uh, and still do, uh, developed friendships and relationships with different people in the body of Christ. I have friends in the Anglican, you know, uh, I have, you know, people in the Baptist, you know, who are friends with me, you know, and they have invited me to preach, you know, to preach for them in different areas, you know, uh, of course I have my Pentecostal brethren, <laughs> You know, word of faith, charismatic, you know, kingdom. I've learned something uh, the Holy Spirit taught me. And it's from that scripture that we pray every day or should be praying every day. And I'm able to comprehend with all saints. That, that's what this thing is actually saying. To comprehend means to understand what is the breadth, the length, the depth and the height. You see, some people are up there. Others are down here. Some people are to the right. Some people are to the left. It's the truth, spiritually speaking. But you'll be able to comprehend with all of them. You know why? God loves all of them. And they are God's children. And whether they have this or they don't have that does not stop God from loving them. See, your lack of knowledge does not stop God from loving you. Now, it will, it will cause you to perish if you don't change it. <laughs> Do you understand? So I'm not, I am not endorsing a lack of knowledge. But I am saying that when you meet people who don't have knowledge in particular areas, you have to be humble. You have to be uh, uh, wise in your dealings with them so you don't close the door to their hearts. And if God has mercy, you can help them to get better. Now, if they don't want to get better, you just love them at the level at which God loves them. It was Papa Ralph who preached this, I can never forget it, it was the, uh, yes, it was the summer of 1993, June 12. Uh, you know, and, and we brought Papa Ralph in, he got out on the last plane, they were going to, they were going to close down the airport, you know, Nigeria was because of the uh, annulment of the uh, 
Chief MQ uh, Abiola election, you know, and they were firing tear gas. I still remember we were out here. We, we just had a you know a shed here, you know. <laughs> Papa Ralph said he thought it was the anointing. Then he realized it was tear gas. You know, he said that jokingly. But I I can never rem- I can never forget the message he gave. You know, I think he was talking about Ruth, and um, if I remember rightly. But I remember the illustration. You know that you know as you grow spiritually you move from the outer court through the holy place into the most holy place when you get to the most holy place you spiritually speaking now as you grow you now join god on the throne then you 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 you, instead of backing something you now turn around then you now see the whole church you now see everybody you know, you see them the way God sees them. So you see the person in the outer court. You see the person in the holy place. You see the person in the most holy place. Then you can then relate to them. So you'll be like God. How many people know that God is in the Catholic Church? Yeah. In spite of all the, uh, some of the things, you know, the Hail Mary and all of that. I remember it was Kenneth Hagin I heard this from. I hadn't been born again. I was still a child then. I was just maybe eight years. It's 1968. The so-called uh, uh, charismatic move, you know, and uh, in Notre Dame, in, in in America, you know, the some of the Catholic nuns. That's where the Catholic charismatic move started. You know, began to speak in tongues. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. People like you know, people, God gave people like an Hagen wisdom. They were, you know, because Ken Hagen used to minister through the, what, the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship. So people from different denominations would come. The Baptists, the Catholics, you know, they come. So Ken Hagen, you know, went for one of the meetings, uh, you know, and, and was telling them that, ah, you know, Mary, Mary spoke in tongues. How people know the Holy Mother spoke in tongues? Mary spoke in tongues. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, there's no good catholic who won't do what the holy mother does they love the holy mother do you know that that's how they got the nuns filled with the holy ghost because everybody wants to be like mary he may have spoken in tongues then every good catholic thinks it's okay for me to speak in tongues amen some of the pentecostal brethren were scandalized how can the Catholic and the, and the same people who speak in tongues still say Holy Mary? <laughs> Comprehend with all saints. What's the breadth, length, depth, and height? Yes. They, 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 I, I can never forget Kenneth Hagin. It stuck with me. You know what he said? He said they can be wrong in their head and right in their heart. I'm going to repeat it. I want everybody to say it after me. He said you can, you can have Christians... Who are wrong in their head. They don't have the right knowledge. But they are right in their heart. And that's what happened to those Catholics. You know. And, and I remember. You know. I had a lot of experiences. You know. I was in. Uh, oh, I was in Kaduna with my friend. Uh, Brother Shagun Falokwe. And he, they brought a tape. You know. It's not tapes anymore. The, you know. Of a Catholic charismatic pastor in New York. I think his sister-in-law used to go to that church. The guy, Catholic. Catholic. He still stayed inside the Catholic church. But he was Catholic, charismatic. He had, you know, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gifts of healing. So, oh, yes. You know? And the guy was ministering. You know, I, I remember listening. I was so blessed and fascinated. I was ministering to the Catholics, you know, even though there were some other things. They were still, they were still, they didn't leave the Catholic Church. So, you know, they still did the Mass and, you know, and do all the things that they do, you know. And then this guy would come and then he would just share small Bible teaching, you know. And people getting born again and filled with Holy Spirit and healed. They can be right in their, wrong in their head. Everybody say it again. But right in their heart. So, walk in love. That's it, folks. 
That's what Paul is saying here. And that's what we, we need the wisdom and the humility of God to be able to do that. So when you meet people, you need discernment to be able to discern where they are in their head. And then relate to them with the heart, with the love of Christ, and see to where you can bring them. I'm going to say something else that's very important here, and it is this. Some people don't want to leave their position. It's sad, but it is true. Well, people who are Baptists, and they'll be Baptists if Jesus comes. <laughs> and I'm wrong in that. Amen. And they don't believe in speaking in tongues. Uh, or they, they, well, this is what the Baptists believe. They believe that do all speak in tongues. You know, so some people may have it. Some people say, if God hasn't given me that, then I don't, you know. <clears throat> and there's nothing you're going to say on this earth that's going to change them. Some of them are like that. You know, what do you do? Love them at that level. Like Papa Ralph said in that message, you know, you come and you see. That's why, watch, watch this. It's not called the judgment throne. It's called the mercy throne. God's throne is not the judgment throne. It's the mercy throne. So you sit on the mercy throne, then like God, you deal with them with mercy. If that is all the guy wants, don't force him. Be like the Holy Spirit. All right, fine. So whatever I can be a blessing to you at that level, I will be. Now, I will encourage you to come forward, but if you don't want to, I'm not going to force you. You're not ready for it yet. Then I meet the other guy at the other level. I meet the other guy that comprehend with all saints. Then what's going to happen is that over time, some will change. Some may not change. And there's nothing you can do on that. Just pray for them, you know, and, and ask for mercy for them. But you see, none of those things are fundamental to going to heaven. So long as I say it's going to go to heaven. Now, I would rather they, 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 they grew spiritually. You know, you know and the Bible says, you know, you know, the spirit may be saved, but they will suffer loss. And I don't want that for them. But if that's their choice then I have to be able to understand that and relate to them at that level and leave it like that. That's what God does. That's what God does with people. I, I'm just, you know, these things are just coming to me by the Spirit. I remember there was one person, uh, Ken Hagen, he, he was a pastor for some years before he went on to what we call field ministry. Then he became an itinerant preacher and he used to go around, you know, you know in the 19... 30s and 1940s and he was a pastor of a church I think it was in East Texas if I remember rightly you know and uh, there was a member of his church who got sick and um, was going to die so they asked Kenneth Hagin to come and pray for him so Kenneth Hagin went to the hospital so when he got there, the Holy Spirit said, don't pray for him to be healed because he's going to die. Okay, he didn't tell him. <laughs> That's why you need wisdom. And he said, God took him again. He said, he's always in and out of church. He'll backslide, he'll come back. He'll backslide, he'll come. He, he was one of these kind of people. And there are many Christians like that, like that up till today. They, they, they are the people who are, they don't have any strong commitment to the things of the Spirit. They're born again. But they're not committed. So, you know, they, they stay in the periphery of the church. You know, the people who stay at the back. Not you at the back there. <laughs> you know, but they're not, they're not committed. You know, you see them today. You won't see them for another two months. Then you see them again. Then you don't see them. You know. <laughs> so, you know what God told Ken Hagen? He said that he has made his peace with me now. He's, you know, so just let him die and let him come to heaven. No point praying for him to get healed. Because if he gets healed again, he can backslide again. And then he might be on the other, on the other side of the fence. Kagan didn't say a word to the guy. He just prayed a general God bless you prayer. Amen. <laughs> the guy died and went to heaven. It takes wisdom to be able to walk in love like that. What did Ken Hagen do? He walked in love. Why did he get him healed? The guy doesn't want to be healed. 
Now, I know he wants to be healed, but what, what, what I mean by that is that, you know, to get healed, there are certain conditions and criteria. And you can't really enjoy it if you don't want to keep the commandments of God and you just want to live the kind of life you want to live. Bottom line, folks, everybody makes their decision. Your destiny is not determined by any other person except you. And it's a decision you make that God will relate to you with. God's purpose is for us, when I say us, now I'm talking about apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, you know, to tell you the whole truth. This is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. this. Now, your, 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 your responsibility is to decide how much of that truth you want to accept. And how much of it you want to walk in. The more of it you want to walk in, praise God. You know, the better. So, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you choose not to walk in certain level of truth, God is not going to throw you out of the church because of that. He's just going to relate to you at that level. And then it is the destiny of that level that you will get. But it's you who made the choice. And we as Christians have to have that discernment. We have to be able to get the wisdom from God to know that this is the level at which this person is operating or has chosen to operate and then walk in love with them at that level and then don't push it. And that's why, by the grace and the mercy of God, over the years, God has had mercy on me to be able to maintain relationships and friendships with people, pastors, ministers, you know, other Christians, you know, because I, I, yet not I, but the grace of God which is me, and able to discern, okay, this is the level of this person, or this is where this person is operating. All right, no problem. So when I meet the person, I, that's what, that's the level at which I, I, I don't start talking about some other things. I just leave it. Verse 2, let everyone please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ, I didn't hear you folks, please not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Verse 4, it's one of the very important verses in the, in, in the New Testament. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learned, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What is Paul telling us here? Everything we read in the New Test Old Testament, well, the scriptures at that time was just the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written, but hadn't yet been compiled, you know, and called the New Testament. So what Paul is saying here is that everything we read in the Old Testament, Joseph, Moses, Enoch, Elisha, Joshua, David, was written for our learning. Everything, all the feasts, all the holy days, all the ceremonial observances, everything. There is something for us as New Testament Christians to learn. New Testament Christians do themselves a great disservice by saying, oh, we don't need the Old Testament because we're living in the New Testament. Nothing could be further from the truth. We need the Old Testament because the Old Testament, all that are written there are written for our learning. They are actually prophetic shadows of things we are now fulfilling in the New Testament. And that's why there are certain things you will never know if you don't know the Old Testament. Because God has hidden certain truths inside the Old Testament shadows. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it is the honor of kings, New Testament kings, where we make kings and priests in Christ Jesus to search it out. So you, we are just supposed to read, study the Old Testament and then learn from it See, I'm not supposed to go to Jerusalem now, you know, in order to be holy. I'm not supposed to go and kill an animal, you know, now to, you know, to use the blood to cover my sin. Jesus has already done that. But there's something for me to learn from that animal sacrifice. Hello? There's plenty for me to learn. Uh, you know, there's a reason why God used, you know, and, and, and uh, why he gave the animal sacrifices. It was a shadow of what Jesus was going to do. You know, and then they were not they are not all the same. There's sin offering. There was peace offering. There was a, a meal offering. And there was burnt offering. 
God revealed to me, Olubi Johnson, years, many years ago, you know, it was since, I think it was 2005, I wrote a message. I've never heard any other person preach on that in that way, you know, called the spiritual sacrifice of the Melchizedek priesthood. And you can find there's a direct one-to-one -one correspondence between the Old Testament sacrifices and what we're doing in the New Testament. You confess your sin, sin offering, peace offering in Jesus' name, I have life. You now have peace with God, you know, meal offering is praise and worship. Burnt offering is praying with tongues and groanings. Nobody taught me that. I, I learned it. Whatever things were, everything is important in its place. Are you listening to me? Nothing in the word of God is superfluous. Superfluous just means it's unnecessary. Everything is important in its place. So you need to understand that. And uh, uh, in, uh, I think it's in Colossians 2.16, he said, all these things, you know, you know, they are shadows of things to come, but the reality is in Christ. And in First Corinthians chapter ten, you know, talk about you know being baptized in Moses in the, in the you know uh, in the in the cloud and in the sea. He said all these things were written as examples to us. So, I, I, there's another scripture I have to share with you, and it is this. Yes, hold hold this one in First Corinthians chapter one. It says now, all these things happen unto them so everything that you read in the old testament or the, the the journeys of israel you know how they move from from egypt into the promised land you know they are all examples or shadows of what we are doing today and they are written for admonition admonition is to teach us upon whom the ends of the world shall come in other words we who are the end time christians are supposed to learn from uh, from all of this. And that's why Paul tells us now in Timothy, he says, all scripture. It was shout all. I, I didn't hear you. All scripture. Turn to everybody say, not some scripture. Not old New Testament alone. All scripture. Old and New Testament. You know, is given by inspiration of God. You know, and it's profitable for doctrine for instruction in righteousness, give me that scripture. Aha, he's got it there. Let's look at verse 16 again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it. All of it. The Old Testament, what Abraham did with, with Sarah, what he did with Hagar, what, you know, what David did, you know, what Tamar did, and all, all the stuff. You read some of those funny stories. You wonder, what has this got to do with me? There's a prophetic shadow in there that has an application to your life today. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof. Sometimes scripture, what is inside scripture is to correct you, to reproof. I just remembered something I'm going to say in a minute. For correction. And that's why people don't like prophetic Old Testament teaching because it reproves, it corrects. For instruction in righteousness. And it has a goal. Next verse. That the man of God may be perfect. I've said this over the years and I'm going to repeat it today. Because it's contextually um, relevant. And it's this. If you don't know all scripture, you're not going to get into perfection. And that's one of the reasons why the knowledge of perfection has eluded a lot of the people in the church. Because they don't read all scripture. Or they don't study all scripture. Or they don't accept all scripture. That the man of God, you cannot be perfect if you ignore some parts of the scripture. Because there's a message for you. There's a prophetic shadow in all of the scriptures. The other day I, I taught on Job's wives and children. Not wives, wife. <laughs> Interestingly, the serious Old Testament saints had only one wife. I know Abraham was serious. I know David was serious. But you can see the flaws in their lives. When you look at something like Joseph, for example, no flaw. One wife. So the issue of one wife was true from the Old Testament. Having said that, I, I said this. And when I was preparing that message, I actually had this thought, but I didn't write it down. So after the message, you know, Pastor Wale... And, uh, and, uh, and Emmanuel, Emmanuel Etu, one of our sons, 
you know, said, Pastor, you know, when you are talking about Job's wife, and I said it could be Job's wife or Job's husband, whether it's a, uh, whether it's the wife who is the praying person, then the husband is the person who is not praying, or, you know, whether it's the husband, then it's now Job's wife. I said, it can be Job's wife or Job's husband. And they said, immediately you said that thing, the person I just thought of was Nabal. For reproof, for correction. Nabal is the Old Testament Job's husband. His wife was the godly one, Abigail. His wife was the one that knew what God was saying and what God was doing. Nabal had no idea. And you know what happened to him? He died, you know. Uh, you know, let me just... Uh, I'm going to close in another few minutes. <laughs> Let me just say a few words about Nabal. Because it has come up. <laughs> Amen. Nabal is typical of a lot of Christians today. They're just like Nabal. Observe, Nabal was an Israelite. You know, he was, he was a child of God. Born, today we'll say he was born again. You know? And he knew what God was. He knew some things were happening. But he didn't appreciate and he had a very proud heart. You know what Nabal said? His, his, uh, his sheep and his cattle were in the wilderness and David's men, because that time they were still running away from Saul, were protecting them. They looked after them while they were in the wilderness. They didn't let people come and steal the sheep and all of that. So, David needed food. So, David now sent to Nabal. And David was so humble. David said, oh, thy servant David, you know, please just find a little something for us and the young men. You know what Nabal said? He said, who is Who is David? There's a reason why I'm saying this. I'm talking about for correction and instruction in righteousness. That's where I'm going. Who is David? These days, everybody, uh -huh, and Nabal answered David, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays <laughs> that break away every man from his master. Nabal was not ignorant. He knew who David was and why David had left Saul. It was common knowledge in Israel at that time. Everybody knew. You know, they don't forget is this David who killed Goliath? Who in Israel didn't know who killed Goliath? Everybody knew who David was. Everybody knew the kind of person David was. The Bible says David, you know, behaved himself wisely. You know, and everybody knew that Saul was trying to kill David. And everybody knew that David had not done anything wrong to Saul. If you had an honest heart, you would know that. Because David and Jonathan were covenant brothers. So people knew. So he wasn't ignorant. It's like today, a lot of people come to church. Oh, they know about manifesting the sons of God. They, they've heard about you know, the buzz that's going on, you know, and all that. But in their heart... They have not embraced that truth. So in the same way, this Nabal worthless fellow, as is the meaning of his name, you know, he said, you know, he was, he was arrogant. Who is David? You know, he break away. His, his master, his soul, he broke away. Then he wants me to come and give him my food. This will be Johnson paraphrase. You know, ha! When David heard the news, he was very angry. Which is why you and I need to control our temper. For the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Even though what Nabal did was wrong, but two wrongs don't make it right. David was about to do something terrible. So David said, God do so. And more unto me. If by this time tomorrow... There remaineth one of the house of Nabal that pisseth against the wall. In other words, going to kill all the male people. All his servants. Now, the servants didn't do anything wrong to David. It was only Nabal that did something wrong to David. Abigail now heard about what was happening. 
So, she being a spiritual woman, quickly packed food and everything and quickly ran to go and meet David as David was coming. She got there and she began to beg him, you know, and said, look, this is my husband. Don't mind him. May your wife or husband never say that about you. He said, don't mind him. That's how he behaves, you know. He's a, he's a, he's a worthless fellow, you know. Who in Israel does not know that you have been anointed to be king? Nabal himself knew. And said, look, don't come and kill these boys. Because if you do, you will have innocent blood on your hands. And when God now makes you king, finally, that thing will be on your conscience. So, don't do it. David listened to that counsel. For correction and instruction in righteousness. David said, okay, all right. What you have said is really true. And I will not, you know. And then he turned back and went. I got news for you. God took over. Let me tell you something. You know, I shared this on Wednesday. You know, we have entered the day of vengeance. In Jesus' day, the day of vengeance hadn't come. Isaiah 61 says this is the acceptable year of the Lord or the day of jubilee and the day of the vengeance of our God. It is the vengeance of our God that is now going to cause the... The, 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 the mourning of the trees of righteousness to stop and that's going to cause the restoration of the ancient places and all of that. Another message for another day. But I want you to understand something about God. When Nabal insulted David, God took it personal. Nabal didn't say anything about God there. But he said that about David. That was God's anointed. That was God's chosen. So who killed Nabal? God. God didn't allow David, David to commit murder. and Because his servants would have defended Nabal if David's men had gone there. That was why they would have had to kill them. You know, in order to take vengeance on, on, on Nabal. We learn a big lesson here. Everybody say, vengeance is mine. See, vengeance belongs to God, not you. You don't know how to take vengeance. Because when you try and take vengeance by yourself, you will hurt other people, innocent people, and ultimately even hurt yourself. Let God handle it. So you know what happened? The Bible says, and when it came to morning light, Abigail now told Nabal everything. He said his heart became a stone. Today we'll call it a stroke. He didn't die immediately. And 10 days later, he died. Did neighbor go to heaven? When we get to heaven, we'll know. <laughs> he probably did. Knowing God, I, I know God because God's so merciful. You know, he probably, that's why he gave him those 10 days in that, you know. So he said, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, and then maybe repented in his heart and then finally he died and then went to heaven. But look at what he lost. Why have I said that story? All scripture is profitable. Look at all the things you learn in that scripture. David was wrong. Nabal was wrong. So even though you, are a, you may be a David, an anointed of God, he doesn't give you the right to get angry and try and avenge yourself. Even what when somebody did was wrong and you are right, you know, you're your, your, your indignation is correct. What David said was right. Well, you know, that guy, the way he behaved was wrong. But why didn't you let God deal with that? So that's why we have to be patient. And that's why we have to be kind. That's why we have to walk in love. So we have to have the wisdom of God. It's not everything you just react. Cool down. I say, God, what do you say here? How do I handle this? That's why you need to walk in love. That's why you need the wisdom of God from God's word. Then you need the compassion of God from the fruit of the spirit. So you behave like, you know, you feel like God in that situation. And then you need the power of the life of God, the ability of the life of God to be able to do what God does. So that's why whatsoever things were written for our full time, were written for our good, for our learning, 
that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. That's why you need to know all those Old Testament stories inside out. So you do your Bible reading every day, come to church, listen to these anointed prophetic teachings so that you will now have the wisdom of God. You know, so when a situation happens, immediately you will know what, like, you know, that's how the, uh, Pastor Wally was able to pick. Ah, said, Pastor, neighbor. I said, I had it in my notes. I just didn't write it. That, I didn't preach it that day. As when I was praying at home, I said, Nabal. Nabal. That's the Old Testament hus- uh, Job's husband. The other thing I preached that same day, you know, that's why you have to know the Bible, you know. And I, I talked about, you know, uh, um, um, Job. Job was a great guy. But you know who he was? The rich young ruler. Once you understand the rich young ruler, you know Job's problem. Job was a good man, like the rich young ruler. All these things have I kept from my youth. I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't commit adultery. Fine. He said, but take up your cross and follow me. He wasn't doing that one. That's where the devil entered in Job's life. But you see, if you don't know the Bible, you cannot relate the rich young ruler to Job and their equivalents. I, am I helping anybody here? Okay. Now, we'll, look, we'll go to verse 7 and then we'll close. Now, the God of patience and consolation. I didn't hear you. Oh, let me make one, one other comment on verse 4. One other very good thing about the scriptures is not only do they give you wisdom for our learning, it gives you hope. You now see how God dealt with the Old Testament saints and helped them, watch this, Pastor Andrew, in spite of their mistakes. If you look at Abraham, for example, you would have thought Abraham had messed up his destiny. But God's mercy. So if Abraham made it, you will make it. Now, don't go and do what Abraham did. Don't go and take a Hagar somewhere. <laughs> don't be silly. Amen. But what I'm saying is that God, you know, the, the scriptures give us hope. Look at Job. You know, and all the terrible things that happened to him. Losing 10 children in one day. Yet God turned the situation around. Your situation is not as bad as Job, so it's going to be well with you. It gives you hope. Now that's why you need to read the scripture. When you read, you know, look at what happened to Job. Look at what happened to David. Look at what happened to Joseph. Look at what happened to all the Old Testament saints. Look at Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at Daniel. You don't know the story of Daniel very well. His parents were killed. You know, at the siege of Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar's armies came in. His life was hanging on a thread. We have no record of his parents. He was, he was taken as a slave to Babylon with, with chain around his neck into the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't know whether they were going to live or whether they were going to die. That's how bad, you know, you, bad the situation of Daniel was. But when Daniel got there, the Bible said he purposed in his heart that he would not defy and he began to get favor with God. He now became the most powerful man in the, Pers- in the Babylonian Empire hope how bad is your situation none of us none of our situations is anything close to what uh, 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 daniel had so it's well with you give yourself a clap offering somebody so when you when you look at your situation and you say, ah, go and look at what happened to job then you will know that you don't even have a problem <laughs> it's true they give you hope Hey, you know, because when you look at your problem and you just look at it only in the context of your problem, you think your problem is bigger than everybody's problem. But when you consider what happened to Job, when you consider what happened to Daniel, when you consider what happened to Abraham, when you consider what, some of the terrible things that happened to all of those people, and yet in spite of that, God's mercy saw them through in the Old Testament. How much more will He see you through in the New Testament, established on better promises? I don't know if you're getting my point. That through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, you might have hope. So when I see things, I, I lie and look in the context of the scripture. Say, so, well, yeah, I got a problem, but it's nothing like the problem of the Old Testament. And if they made it, then I'm going to make it now. Are you following me? Good. Right. Now, the God of patience and consolation, I didn't hear you, grant you to be like-minded 
one to one another according to Jesus Christ. In other words, behave like Jesus. Be patient and forbearing and long suffering with other. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also has received us to the glory of God. In other words, let's, I got it in my notes here. Let us treat one another like Jesus treats us. Jesus accepts you in spite of your faults, instead in spite of your weaknesses. And then he helps you with patience and forbearance to gradually overcome those faults. And you need to have the same thing. Have the same attitude of compassion to one another that Jesus has to us. Unity of attitude of love, forgiveness, and forbearance. The unity. Now, all of us should have the same attitude of love the same attitude of forgiveness and the same attitude of long suffering and forbearance towards one another in the same way jesus has it towards us then we can strengthen and help one another last scripture we could go go there and then I'm, i'll probably repeat it in my next something but i'll, I'll just touch on it it's psalm 133 A beautiful scripture you know, and uh, uh, there's a truth I want to bring out. Okay, this is not scripture. I will, I will, I will look at it today, and then I will, you know, expatiate on it next week. It says, uh, "A song of degrees of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant." I didn't hear you. It is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is. That is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment or anointing upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirt of his garment, as the dew of Hermon, dew is like water, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, I say Zion, he's talking about the perfect church here, for there the Lord hath commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, or Zoe, what is God saying? This is what he's saying. When we have the attitude, when we have a unity of the attitude of forgiveness, of love, of forbearance. Forbearance means you, 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 you forbear with people in spite of their faults. You don't throw them away because of their faults. You, 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 you maintain your relation, your fellowship with them. You know, trusting that God will help them. Now, what happens is this: the Lord. I, I, showed me it's like a vision it wasn't a vision but it's revelation some revelation is so clear in your heart it's almost like seeing a vision but it's not a vision he showed me what he's saying about here what he's talking about here so when you look at the head of course we know jesus is the head you know but he's if you look at look like the head of the church like me now by the grace of the mercy of god like a pastor you know or like a father in a family you're the head of that home you know you know what you should be doing from you should be coming down three things forgiveness which the blood of jesus christ to remit the sins of the people under you life the Bible says, if you see your brother's sin ask life for them then you pray for them in the spirit you pray for them in tongues you know what you're doing you're literally raining righteousness upon them what is from the head is now flowing down to the rest of the body and you are allowing it to flow because the thing that will block it from flowing, you are removing it by remitting their sin. You are asking life for them. You are praying for them in the spirit. So, uh, the, the love of God, the goodness of God from the head, whoever is the head, you know, whoever is the leader, you know, is flowing down. Notice it doesn't flow up from the bottom. It flows down from the top. Because the guy who is on top ought to know better. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. So the guy who is strong, the guy who is at the head, should allow the life of God. He should allow the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness, the life of God to help them overcome their sin. You know, the, the, the power of God by the Holy Spirit. You know, this thing to flow. Now, watch this. Stand to your feet. We're closing.
if everybody does that. That's why it's unity. Not only the head does that, but the person that is directly under the head, he too does it. So not only the husband does it, the wife too is doing it. Then the children too are doing it. In a church like this, the, the senior pastor is doing it. Then the other pastors too are doing it. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the activity group leaders too are doing it. And everybody is doing it. You know what's going to happen? It says it, it will be life. That's how God heals the body. That's how the church will grow. And that's what God wants us to learn. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and then help on her. And then we're able to help them overcome their weakness. Now, like I explained, some people won't even overcome some weaknesses. They may choose to stay where they are. It doesn't matter. Still love them. Amen. Now, they will get their reward. <laughs> there is no doubt about that one. Amen. And, and they, they, will, they, will, they will reap the consequences of their choices. But for you, you walk in love towards everybody. Let's talk to God. We continue our study. We're in Romans chapter 15. And in our last lesson, we looked at verses 1 through 7. And uh, basically... What Paul uh, was telling us here is that the strong should help the weak. When you're stronger in faith than other people in some areas, you do not despise them, you don't look down on them, and most importantly, you avoid doing anything that will offend them, that will make them stumble, you know, uh, and that will make them weak. Rather, you should do things uh, in, in a way that will make them, to encourage them and to strengthen them. And particularly when it's not anything that is fundamental, you come down, so to speak, to their level. The Apostle Paul, I, I, didn't, I, I mentioned this last week, you know, he said that to the, to, the, to the Jew, I become like a Jew. To them that are, give me that scripture, I think it's in First Corinthians somewhere, you know, he said, I became all things to all men that I might win all. You know, uh, that's not only for unbelievers, it's also even for your Christian brethren. You know, they may not, you know, uh, understand some things in some areas. Then you come, you know, you, 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 you two. Yes, thank you. First Corinthians chapter 9, it's in verse 22. It says, to the weak, I became as weak. Now, I'm not weak, but I become as, as if I am weak, you know. I made all things to all men that I might gain them. You know, for those who are not born again, get them in. Those who are already born again, help them to come to a higher level. There's, there's something I've said, and I've said over the years, you know, I always say to everybody, you know, when I speak to them, I say, love never fails. It never fails. You know, it's pride and arrogance that makes us, you know, want to show off our faith and despise those who don't maybe not have the faith that we have, you know, the strength of faith that we have at that particular point in time or in a particular area. And, and, and one we need, we all need to guide against that thing because uh, pride is an intrinsic part of the sin nature that is still resident to some degree, you know, in our souls and in our bodies. One of the greatest deceptions any Christian can tell himself is that, oh, I'm not proud. Oh, of course you are, <laughs> because it's intrinsic. Unless you've entered perfection, you know, and, uh, and you become established in it, can you say, oh, I'm not proud? You know, that, 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 that pride is an innate, it's intrinsic in the sin nature. And so long as some of the sin nature is still in the soul and in the body, it will try and come up. Now, the good news is that you can overcome it and you should overcome it and you should suppress it. But to say it's not there would be to, to tell a lie to yourself. Uh, the Apostle John tells us the same thing in 1 John chapter 1. He says, if we say we have no sin, he said we deceive ourselves. And he's talking to born again Christians. Now, how we, well, but we're born again, we don't have sin. Yes, uh, there's no sin in our spirit, but there's still sin in the soul and in the body. And observe, he didn't even say, you know, he said it in two ways in, in that portion of scripture. He said, if we say we have not sinned, that's something I do. 
They say, if we say we have no sin, that's something I have. I may not have done anything, but it's there. And I need to understand that. And that's that, that understanding, one, will keep me humble. Two, will keep me on my toes spiritually to keep flushing out the sin nature. See, so long as I think I don't have any sin nature, I'm very deceived. Because I will not, do, I will not take the necessary uh, steps, the necessary diligence, you know, to, to get rid of it using the blood, the word, and the spirit. That's why people don't pray in the spirit and they don't, you know, pray with travail, with any type of fervency because they don't see the point of what you're doing, you know, and because they don't understand that that nature is still there. That sin nature is still in the soul and in the body, even though the spirit is born again. And what God wants is to use the, 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 the life and the power of God that's from your spirit through confession speaking God's word through prayer to dominate firstly and then secondly to clean out the sin nature in the soul and body and when you do that then uh, you become more and more like Jesus and then you will be you'll do what he has said here the strong will help the weak and you see Jesus doing that all of his life and ministry you see him relating to people you know who ordinarily he should have uh, despised or looked down on. The other day, you know, the Lord was speaking to me about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody is trying to invite me for something. I'm not sure where I'm going to go yet. I'm still praying about it. You know, but the Lord reminded me. He said that, you know, you said, you remember, I went to the synagogues of the Pharisees. He said, I didn't like them. I didn't like what they were doing. He said, but there are a lot of innocent people in there. So I didn't go just because of the people. Because of the pastors or the, or the leaders, I went because of the people. And also, also for the pastors, for those that I can help. You know, he said, and you need to have my mindset. You know, you need to have, you know, the, the, what we call the mind of Christ. The humility of the mind of Christ. You find Jesus going to, in fact, there was one guy, you know, uh, in one of the Gospels that invited Jesus to his house, you know, for lunch or or supper, whatever it was, you know, and Jesus went. This guy didn't like Jesus at all, you know, and uh, when Jesus got there, they, you know, they served the food and all of that, you know, and Jesus was eating with them, and Jesus knew the kind of people those people were. He knew, he knew, he knew their, their wrong attitude, but that didn't stop Jesus from going. Then, uh, the, the, the thing I remember most is that while Jesus was sitting with them and eating, you know, you know you normally you don't eat in the house of your enemy. <laughs> but, you know, he didn't consider them enemies. He considered them weak in faith. So he became weak, uh, you know, as if they, he, he's like them. But he's, he's not like them. So, and while they were doing that, a woman comes who is a sinner. She probably was a prostitute. You know, and probably... Many of those people may have had dealings with her in the past, you know. So this woman comes in while Jesus is, is, is reclining and teaching and all of that. And she begins to cry. And she now begins to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears. Immediately, the hypocrisy of these guys. This is the guy who invited him for lunch. Immediately, they had, their hypocrisy came up. Their indignation. They didn't say it out. They said it inside. They said, if this man was truly the kind of prophet he claims he is, he would know the, this, what kind of person this woman is, and he would never allow him to touch. They, in other words, they began to doubt his integrity. That maybe, you know, he's not as holy as he is claims he is, you know, and he's not really as, he's, he don't really know God the way he claims he does, because he said, I'm the son of God, you know, immediately Jesus picked in the spirit, he picked what they were thinking, and he, he, the way he handled it, he, God will help us, don't your neighbor say, God will help us to become more like Jesus, Jesus didn't, he, he did not fight with them. Look at how he handled it. He said, Simon, I have something to ask you. 
I'm talking about, you see, that's why it takes the wisdom of God to walk in the love of God. This is another beautiful demonstration. He says, Simon, I have something to ask you. He said that two people owed somebody some money. One owed them, you know, maybe like 10,000 naira. I'm just using, you know, to use our own contemporary currency. You know, and the other person owed maybe like uh, 100 naira. So he now said that, but the man just forgave both of them. He said, who do you think will love him most? And the man said, well, I guess the guy that he forgave most would, you know, feel more indebted to him and love him most. He said, Simon, you've, he, said, he said, you've answered rightly. Now watch this. He said, I came to your house. You didn't even give me water to wash my feet. You didn't give me any ointment for my hair. He said, but this woman, she has not ceased to cry and to dry my feet, wash my feet with her hair and her tears. She said, even though she's done a lot of bad things, I've forgiven her. For who, to whom much is forgiven, the person loves much. You know? And I'm sure they will, they will, they will, they will this man, now, what they did was wrong. Somebody of Jesus' stature. And even in those days, even though Jesus, you know, lived a humble life, but people knew the quality of person he was. He wore very nice clothes, you know. Jesus was, was, was prosperous, you know. And he was highly revered, you know. Highly reverenced in the community, you know. It was a privilege for Jesus to come to your house. He didn't go to everybody's house. So, a person of Jesus' stature coming to your house, it was the courtesy of those days. It was the normal thing that you would do is to wash their feet. To wash their feet, what they didn't do, because it was, they, they lived in, a, in the desert. Well, not desert, but, you know, it was a sandy environment, you know, and they wore sandals. It's not like shoes that we wear today that are covered. So, normally, your, your, your leg would have picked up some dirt. So, when you come into the house, it, the normal courtesy that you give a honored guest is that your own servants will come and they will take a something, uh, a towel, then they will pour water and clean their feet before they sit down to eat. They didn't do it for Jesus. It was, it was, a, it was a great act of e e irreverence. But you know what? Jesus never, he didn't say a word about it. He went, sat down and ate his food you know, and was reclining and everything. It was not until this woman came and, and, and now said, you know, and they, and they, they now started thinking all these negative things in their hearts. That Jesus now pointed out to them. And even then, he did it nicely. He just said, okay. You know, and of course, I'm sure the guy felt, you know, he, he felt in his heart. He, he felt convicted in his heart of his wrong attitude and something. And then, you know, the Bible says, and they began to wonder, say, who then is this <laughs> that forgives, you know, that says he has power to forgive sins. So that's, that's an example of, you know, walking in love to the weak, you become as weak. He just wasn't weak, but he just, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't uh, show off. You know, he didn't, he didn't try and put them down. He still went to his house, still ate his food. And even after all of that, he still was still there. And then, you know, the woman came and then she went. And then, before, then they finished the meal. I'm sure they would have asked him many questions and then he would have left the place. So we need to understand uh, uh, this and behave like uh, 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 Jesus did. You know, I put it here. Uh, 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 he says, Wherefore receive ye one another, that's verse 7, as Christ also hath received us to the glory of God. It's a great statement. How did Christ receive me and you? I'm going to tell you how. He received us with love. He received us with forgiveness. He received us with kindness. He received us with patience. And received us with forbearance. When you got born again, you were a sinner. You were, you, you, you were not attractive at all. You know, but Jesus loved you in spite of it. And he received you. And then he was patient with you. And kind with you in spite of all your infirmities and all your shortcomings. 
and he was forbearing. And, 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 and over time, you've now begun to change. You know, you haven't changed, but you're changing. Everybody turn to your neighbor. <laughs> Say, I, have, I may not have changed perfectly yet, but I am changing. You know, and, and, and that's how God is. God takes us. He, he knows you, you're not, you are, you're changing, but you haven't yet changed completely. You know, but that's all right. I mean, it's not all right. You don't, you don't want to stay in that state. You want to get completely changed. But what I mean is that he accepts you. He receives you. And you need to, we need to do that to one another. The fact that somebody has not completely changed in some areas does not mean you should reject them. At least you should be able to say, okay, you've changed to some degree, but you need to change more. And then I'm going to show you more grace. I'm going to show you more love. I'm going to show you more kindness. I'm going to show you more forbearance as you change. And that's how we should do one to another. Say, wherefore? I didn't hear you. Receive ye one another as Christ also hath received us to the glory of God. If we will be a little bit more patient with one another, we will be able to help one another greatly to make uh, uh, tremendous progress spiritually. Everybody say, love never fails. It doesn't, folks. It doesn't, you know. Uh, and, 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 and Jesus is our example. He had a lot of people around him who were not very good people, <laughs> some of them, you know. But Jesus... He didn't change everybody, but God used him to change a lot of people. You know, uh, I, I just remembered this. It's just come up to me. It's like a tweet. You know, Simon Peter. We call him Simon Peter. He was Jesus's, one of Jesus' uh, closest uh, uh, disciples and associates. You know, Peter had a lot of faults. A lot. He was rambocious. He, was, he always wanted to be number one. You know, he was proud. He was arrogant. And, you know, he was, you know, and uh, even towards the Lord Jesus Christ sometimes. You know, this shall not be to thee, you know. And that time Jesus had to. But you see how Jesus dealt with him. He dealt with him with such grace, with such forbearance with such kindness and 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 that's what we need to learn one time he this is what the holy spirit just brought to me this was in the early part they they you need to understand how they came you know first of all it was andrew and john who heard john the baptist say behold the lamb of god then they followed jesus you know those were the first two then andrew is uh, peter's brother so he now went to call peter so when Peter came, Jesus said, you're Simon, you become a rock. You know, you're, you're Simon, but you call a, call the rock. And that, then they started following him. But they didn't follow him completely. They would come, and then they would go back to their fishing. They would come, and then they would go back. This was in the first few, maybe, days and weeks. You know, you can surmise all of this from the scripture. Then, one day, Jesus went to go and meet them in their where, where, they were, where they had their fishing boat. Because that was their business. John and James, Andrew and Peter. They, are, they, they were fishermen by business. That's how they made their living. So, that, though they, they had had contact with Jesus, and they, they would come, then they would go back. They would come, then they would go back. But Jesus wanted them full time, so to speak. So, he, he didn't rebuke them. He went to go and see them. You know, where they were fishing. So he got into the boat with them and said, oh, let, let's, 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 let's move out a little bit. And, and they did. And, uh, and then Jesus, he said, oh, you haven't caught any fish. He said, what's happening? And then um, Peter said, well, you know, today's one of those days. There's just no fish. You know, we've told all night long. Then Jesus said, all right. He said, cast on the other side of the something. He said, Lord. This is Olubi Johnson paraphrase. And, and, you know, Lord, I'm an experienced fisherman. This is what I do for a living. I'm telling you, there is no fish. We've been doing this for years. But, everybody give a lot of clap offering. 
at thy word. At thy word, I will cast. So he did. The Bible says they could, the, the amount of fish that they go so much that, you know, they, they had to call James and others, you know, for, because they were all partners. It, it was a big business, you know, and, and they put all the fish into the boat. Now, this is the part the Holy Spirit reminded me of. Then the boat began to sink. You know what Peter said? He said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You know, Jesus' act of kindness convicted him. He said, Lord, he said, depart from me. Uh, I can see the twinkle in Jesus' eyes. You know, Jesus is such a nice person. He, he wasn't angry with him. He, he said, from henceforth, you become, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. From that time, they stopped going back to fishing every day. They started following him, you know, on a much more consistent basis. So, what do we learn from this? Let, receive ye one another. As Christ also has received us to the glory of God. So, when you meet people, you know, or you're interacting with people, you will see all kinds of problems in their lives and faults. Correct them in love, then receive them. And, 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 and then give them space and time to uh, keep changing. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 8. Now I say, I didn't hear you, that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. I'm going to stop in this verse and I'm going to go to the next ones in a minute. But... I want us to look at something here. The word circumcision there just means Jews. Anytime you, particularly in Paul's letters, anytime you see the circumcision, he's talking about natural Jews. Because it was only the Jews back then that used to circumcise. The Gentiles weren't, didn't circumcise. So, and, and, and the Jews were, oh my God, have mercy on them. They were so proud of this circumcision thing. They felt that Circumcision put them apart from other Gentiles, made them superior, you know, because the, the, the circumcision was the sign of the covenant that they had, you know, with, through their father Abraham with God. And the Gentiles that didn't have circumcision were regarded as dogs and infidels and, and, and people who didn't know God. <laughs> and you know the important thing? It was true. <laughs> It was true, you know. But you see, the problem with that mentality, it was true. You know, but even though something may be true, your attitude towards it may be wrong. Their attitude of superiority, their attitude of looking down on the Gentiles, their attitude of spiritual pride was wrong. Even though what they, what they, what, what, what they were saying was true. Contrast that with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was Hebrew of Hebrews. <laughs> Seed of Abraham. Take his genealogy from his mother, Mary, you'll get it. Take his genealogy from his stepfather, Joseph, you'll get it. You know, he was, he was, he was. But you know how Jesus behaves, you know? You see him talking to the Samaritan woman. You see him talking, because some of those, those ones, some of them were not circumcised, you know? You see how he even dealt with some of the Gentiles. Uh, the centurion. You know, who was a Gentile, you know, not circumcised, you know. And, and, they, and they came to him and said, look, this man, he's a good man. He's helped us build a synagogue that gave him a legal basis. He says, I will bless them that bless you. He said, he said, he said my servant is sick. He said, come to my house, come to my house. You know, please, you know, come and let him come and heal him. And Jesus was going. Jesus was ready to go. He was, in fact, he wasn't ready to go. He was going. And, and, and the man sends back and says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. I'm uncircumcised. I'm not worthy. And then he said to him, he said, he said, just speak the word and my servant shall be healed because I'm a man under authority. And Jesus was, was amazed. He said, wow. I said, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. Commended a dog 
in quotes, an uncircumcised person. This same mentality was what was in the time of Paul. Jesus had died now and gone to heaven. When Paul began his ministry, this question of circumcision, because the, the Jews were so proud spiritually about this. You know, they looked down on the Gentiles. So, anybody they saw that was not circumcised, even after they got born again, you know, without circumcision, like Cornelius' house, nobody was circumcised. They were all Gentiles. Then the Holy Ghost came and they spoke in the... They, the God knows how he knew his people. If God did not allow them to speak in tongues, they would never have believed they got born again. Because they were not circumcised. In fact, Peter, Peter, the Bible says, Peter and the people who were with him, he said, they were shocked. That's why God had to give Peter that vision about unclean things coming from heaven. I said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He said, oh God, you don't know anything. <laughs> All of my days, I have never eaten anything unclean. God was trying to prepare him to receive the Gentiles into the, something without circumcision. So, the, the issue of circumcision was a big issue to the Jews. And even after they had all of this knowledge and all of the, 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 the right thing, that, that prejudice was still strong in their hearts. So, someone like Paul would go out of his way, even though he knew it was not necessary. So, you take someone like Timothy. You see, Timothy's mom was Jewish, but his father was Greek. So, Paul, he just circumcised. <laughs> Got him circumcised. And then some of the other guys who worked with Paul, you know, where he could, he would say, look, it, it's not, it doesn't make you more righteous. But, you know, so that these guys just won't make too much noise. You know, get yourself circumcised. What are we saying? God is telling us that you can have truth. You can know the right thing. But your attitude to those who don't have it is also critical. You should not have uh, an attitude of spiritual pride or, uh, of, or, or, or superiority. And so Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision, the Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The, you see, God had made a promise to Abraham particularly, and then it, by, 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 by extension to Isaac and Jacob, and all the, uh, you know, the, the, the patriarchs of, of the Jewish race, you know. But that, those promises, watch this, were not confirmed. In other words, they were not fulfilled until Jesus came. They were promissory notes. It was Jesus' coming, becoming the Son of God, living the kind of life he lived, dying on the cross and being raised from the dead, that finally confirmed them. And then by extension, those blessings and promises now went to the Gentiles. Which was God's original plan. See, God, 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 God never looked down on the Gentiles. But he had a plan. And the plan was, look, he took a man called Abraham. Separated him from his parents. From his people. You know. Sadly, Abraham made a few mistakes. It took Lot and took his dad and some other people around. That God didn't ask him to take. You know, then his dad died, terror. Then, you know, he, had, he still had Lot with him. And then he made a covenant with him. And then he, you know, started blessing him and all that. The plan was very simple. I'm going to make a covenant with Abraham. I will make a nation of him through him. Through that nation, I will bring the Messiah into the earth. Then the Messiah will now die. Pay the price for the sins of all men. And then the blessings I have given to Abraham will now extend to the rest of humanity. He had to do it in a restricted way because he couldn't just go to all nations. Because you must understand that after the fall of man, God was on the outside looking in. Satan had taken over the whole of humanity. So for God, for God to come in, he had to look for him. He, he looked for a righteous lineage that he could work through. It wasn't because he didn't care about the other people. It was because he was here to do this first. Then when that is done, then he can extend it to other people. Is it clear? It's very important you understand this so that you, you know, we, nobody has, should have either a sense of inferiority or a sense of superiority. God loves all men. 
the same really. It's just that he had to do certain things to the Jew first. Because that was the way the plan would work. And so, uh, let's read now about the Gentiles. And then we'll, we'll, we'll look at a few scriptures. He says, that the Gentiles... Let, let's read it again. He said, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. You understand now? For the truth of God, or God's word. God's word is truth. To confirm... The promises made unto the Father. The promises have been made unto the Father, but it was not confirmed until Jesus came. That and that. Everybody say, and. That means that God has not forgotten the Gentiles. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause will I confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing to thy name. It is one of the prophetic scriptures about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in Psalm 18, as well as uh, uh, Second uh, Samuel chapter 22. You know, then in, in, in verse 10 it says, And again, he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. You find this all over the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, Psalms, you know. So you, if, if you study the scriptures properly, you will see that God had never forgotten the Gentiles. He had always had a plan, and even Israel, the natural Israel, was actually supposed to be a model that would be attractive to the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, they called them proselytes. L let me give an example. The Queen of Sheba traveled all the way, like Jesus said, from the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, from Ethiopia, wherever she was, all the way to Jerusalem to come and hear the wisdom of Solomon. God, God so blessed Solomon and, 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 and built that wonderful temple and his house and, and the riches that he gave him. You know, it was supposed to attract Gentiles so that they will come and then they will come to know the God of Abraham. And Make a covenant with him, you know, and, and, and get to know him. Even in the Old Testament, there was a provision for Gentiles. They would just become proselytes. Then they would start, you know, if you go and read the whole of the Old Testament, the Bible says that, you know, uh, um, um, not only for you, but any the stranger that is with you. So if you, if you came to the Jews and you joined them, even though you may not be Jewish, and you too get circumcised, and you start keeping the... the, the Back in the Old Testament, you keep the Feast of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. The same blessings come to you. That's, that's how God, that was a provision that was available under the Old Covenant. But through Jesus Christ now, the, all the same blessings have come to everybody. He says, and he, again he saith, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and Lord him. All ye people, that's in Psalm 117. The whole, the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament has reference to God wanting to bring in the Gentiles. Verse 12, and again, you see Paul has quoted almost four or five scriptures now, you know. Uh, that's what characteristic you see of Paul's writing. Not only Paul, but all the New Testament writers, they always took their basis from the Old Testament. They never said anything without a base in the scripture, in the Old Testament scripture. And again, Isaiah saith, there will be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles trust. He's talking about Jesus. I, Isaiah 11 is all there. Everything. So God, God, the gen, listen to me. The Gentiles were not an afterthought. They were an intrinsic part of the plan of redemption. And I'm going to show you two from our scripture in just a minute. Now, okay, let, let, let me stop there and then I'll quickly take that. Look at Genesis chapter 22. Then you see this truth clearly. So I don't have any inferiority because you're a Gentile. See, the Jew is not superior to you. And you are not superior to the Jew. 
You're all men, made in the image and likeness of God. God loves all of you. Now, he did a work through the, through the Jew first. And there is an advantage of being Jewish. The Bible tells us in, in, in Romans, he says, what advantage has the Jew then? He said, chiefly much in every way. But primarily because they were made the oracle, they were made the custodians of the oracles of God. So a Jew has an advantage if he will use it. Now, if he doesn't use it, you know, then it becomes a, it, it can become a disadvantage, you know. So, but it does not it does not take away from anything from the Gentile because it, smart Gentiles should I use the word smart? You know, honest Gentiles, you know, will go to the Jew and get the oracles from them and then get into their blessings. And so God is, is, is telling us here, Genesis chapter 22. Am I helping anybody here? And uh, I'm going to look at verses 17 and 18. This is where we get Jehovah Rapha from, you know, or Jehovah Jireh. But, you know, I don't want to go into a long story now. But, but you see, when Abraham obeyed God by putting down his son Isaac, you know, uh, for his sacrifice, of course God didn't want to kill Isaac. He just wanted Abraham to be willing to do it to give him a basis for the covenant. And Abraham, thank God, Abraham. Let's give Father Abraham a super clap offering. Thank God, Abraham, he passed that test. So God now pronounced the plan. He said, verse, let, let me start from verse 16. And, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou, Abraham, hast done this thing, and has not will death help thy son, thy only son, that in blessing will I bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Watch this, verse 18, very important. And in thy seed shall all, notice not some, all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God now pronounced he had actually said it before in Genesis chapter 12 but Abraham by that act Abraham now kicked into effect the fulfillment of the Old Testament which is this uh, you know I think Papa Ralph said this many years ago and I've also said it you know the this this was a plan God married Israel in the Old Testament to produce one son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would die for the sins of the world. God now in the New Testament is marrying the church to produce many sons who will die spiritually, not physically. They will die to self for the life of the world. The Apostle Paul says it in Second Corinthians in chapter 4. He said, so then, Death walketh in us, but life in you. Every son in the old in the New Testament is to has to learn how to die to self, crucify the flesh and all, so that he can give life to people in the world. Jesus died for our sins, we die for the life of the world. So that the world can be blessed. People can get born again, they can get you know healed, they can get delivered. But for that to happen, you have to deny yourself and die to self. It's the same pattern. Am I talking to anybody here? And so here we see the plan kick into effect. You see, it was a plan. It was in the mind of God. Watch this. But it hadn't yet uh, gone into operation and could not go into operation until Abraham fulfilled his part. And it took many years. God called him and said, look, come, I'm going to make a great nation of you. In you. In Genesis chapter 12. This is 22. This is 25 years later. No, more than 25 years. Uh, Isaac was already a young boy. Maybe he was about 14, 15 years old. We're looking at about 40 years later. So God now says, okay, 
get the son. It took 25 years to even get the boy. Then the boy now grows up to be about 13, 14 years old. God now said, go and sacrifice the boy. That was crucial because until Abraham could give up his son, God had no legal basis to give up his own son. So Abraham's act of obedience, of giving up his son, was what now put God on a legal spot. God legally now had to now bring his own son. And watch this, honey. Not only his son, but his son now for the Gentiles. So Jesus will now come to confirm the promises that God had made to Abraham. He's now going to confirm. Jesus now came to confirm it, not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Glory be to God. Am I talking to anybody here? So you need to understand, you know, a little act of obedience can have great legal implications. And a little act of disobedience can do the same. Just that. Yeah, and, and, and you know God, eh, so he won't even tell you what's happening. He will tell you, but not everything. That's why you have to operate in faith. God did not tell Abraham the plan in his heart. All he just told him is that, take thy son. <laughs> God can be very interesting. Thy only son, whom thou lovest. And go and make him a burnt offering, a sacrifice. That's how they used to do in those days. They would kill the animal, then they would burn it on, on, on the uh, altar. Uh, go and take him as a burnt sacrifice. Watch this. To the mountain which I will show you. He hasn't even shown him the mountain yet. You can imagine. Hey, this Isaac. We took 25 years to get him. Now we have him. I'm, not, I'm 100. And by this, this time, I was probably 115 or something years old. And this God is not telling me to go and sacrifice him. You see, if you don't know God, that's what I was sharing on Wednesday. That's why people get offended. You see, when you don't understand God's character, everybody say, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If God said, go and sacrifice Isaac, go and sacrifice Isaac, in him is no darkness at all. You know why? He must have a reason. He must have a plan. So, it took Abraham three days. You know, it was in, they didn't have cars in those days. The place where it was Mount Moriah is the same Mount Calvary where Jesus was crucified. Give the Lord a clap offering. Way thousands of years before. The same place. I will show you the mountain. I'll take the boy. So all oh, he didn't tell he didn't tell Sarah. Don't those are accounts you don't tell your wife. She wouldn't, she would not, she would have messed it up emotionally. Ah, you will kill the two of us. <laughs> you know, I've told you all your prayer, prayer, prayer. I told you one day it's going to turn your head. <laughs> How can God tell you to go and kill your son that you gave us? So he didn't say a word to her. There are times you don't say anything to your wife. You know, because they may not be able to handle it emotionally or, or, or spiritually sometimes. You know, so he, he took the boy. Three days. Plenty of time to think. Plenty of time to go back. Plenty of time to say, ah, this can't be God. But you know what? He thought it through. The scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews. He thought it through. One, I know God. I've known him now for over 40, about 40 years. I know when he took me from Ur of the Chaldees. And all of us need to go through this mental process in our thinking, renewing of our mind. You know, so whenever you're faced with a problem, don't just get worried and start because of the, the think back. I know how he took me from Ur of the Chaldees, where my ancestors were worshipping the moon. And how he blessed me. He blessed me financially. He looked after me all these years. He protected me. He helped me to overcome all these kings, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of that. You know? And even when I thought I was not going to have a son and I made a mistake and I went through um, 
when I had this affair with Hagar and had Ishmael, he still didn't throw me away. And now, just, you know, uh, 10, 15, 14, 15 years ago, this boy Isaac was born supernaturally. My body was almost dead. God revived it. Revived the womb of my wife. These are the things you'll be thinking. And the, we had the boy. If he has told me, if it's the same God who has told me to sacrifice the boy, if I sacrifice him, he will raise him from the dead. Give the Lord a clap offering. The Bible says that Abraham received him in a figure. Do you know you need to do that in your life? It may not be an Isaac going to kill your son or anything like that. But you know, sometimes God will ask you to do some things or some things will happen. You wonder, ah, God, how can you allow this kind of thing to happen to me in my life? Don't doubt God. Though. He is light. And in him is no darkness at all. When you don't understand, pray more in the spirit. Go to the scriptures. Think back on every good thing God has done. Then be like Abraham and say, Okay, even if the worst happens, you will raise me from the dead. You know, we've just gone a full circle. I know, you know how full circle is? He says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. And they love not that. Abraham got to the point where he did not love his life unto the death. Full circle. And that's where we all need to come to. In our faith as Christians. The last. I'm going to start this. I will not finish it today. But let's go back to Romans chapter 15. I don't know if I've helped anybody here. And let's look at verse 13. I'm going to start it today. See. Now the God of hope. I didn't hear you. Huh. Feel you. With all joy and peace in believing. I just got a tweet. Do you know, I want to give you a, a, a clue from this scripture. How to know when you are actually acting in faith and then when you are acting in fear. When you are believing, you will have those two things. Joy and peace. If you don't have peace, you don't have joy, you're not believing, you're doubting. When you're faced with a difficult situation and there's you know, he said, fill you with all joy and peace in quietness and in confidence shall your strength be. When there's and you know how to quench it? Prayer. If you pray in the spirit, the Bible says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, Continue instant in prayer. It's one of the reasons why we pray with supplication. You see, when you pray with supplication, the Holy Spirit goes into your mind, your will, and your emotions. And it begins to overcome the infirmities, particularly fear and doubt. Last week, I talked about understanding spiritual forces. You know, it begins to counteract those. Remember all those things that they are forces too. Fear, doubt, they are spiritual forces. So, the Joy and peace are also spiritual forces. So when you pray a lot in the spirit, the, 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 the joy, the peace will come from your spirit into the soul and counteract and dominate and push down the fear and doubt. And when you do it sufficiently, then you have joy and peace in believing. When there's anxiety, scripture, be careful for nothing. You can now see how the whole thing, Pastor G, mom, how the whole thing ties together. This Bible was written by the Holy Ghost. Be careful for nothing. The, the Amplifier says, Do, have no anxiety. Be not anxious about anything. But it's not automatic. He said, but in everything. By prayer. But it didn't stop there. Supplication. <laughs> Supplication. Which is an asking for mercy. To deal with that thing. By prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. Watch this. And the peace of God. See how it all ties together. That 
passeth all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Watch this. If you don't pray, the anxiety will prevail. I've seen that in my life and my experience, my wife and I. You know, I mean, we faced different challenges and we still face challenges. You know, I've learned and I'm still learning. Now, when I'm facing anything, I don't talk, I don't worry, I just go into prayer. Praying your spirit. Sometimes it will take a day, sometimes it will take a week. I just keep praying. I just keep praying. I just keep praying. And you know what happens? What happens is exactly what the Bible says. And the peace of God. It's, 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 it's a battle. That's why I preached to you last week about spiritual forces. You see, as I'm praying in the spirit, the forces of joy and peace are emanating from my spirit to counteract the forces of anxiety and worry that are coming from the air through my mind and my, uh, 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 my flesh. So if I stay with that prayer, I'm going to overcome it. That peace will settle. That joy will settle. That's why he said, don't worry about anything. But in some things, in everything. And then he tells you how, by prayer and supplication. Where do you see prayer and supplication again? Ephesians 6. See how the whole thing is tied together. Put on the whole armor of God. Now you're able to stand out against all the wise of the devil. And then he says, pray always. Not, not, not occasionally. Pray always, daily, regularly, with all kinds of prayer. And where is it again? Supplication. See it again. It's a recurring decimal. It's telling you the key to having joy. Having peace in believing. When there's anxiety, you know what you just told me? You're not praying enough. I didn't hear amen. <laughs> I didn't hear amen. Oh. When there is fear, there's anxiety, there's something. You just told me with your own mouth that I've not been praying enough. I didn't say you didn't pray. Oh. I said enough. So what should you do? What the Bible says. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Patient just means consistent. Continuing instant in prayer. You pray until there is peace. Hallelujah. Fill you with all joy and peace and belief that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to deal with this hope thing with more with greater emphasis and clarity next week. But let, 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 let me just leave, it with, leave this with you. Hope is a positive expectation. I use the word positive. Of, of what God has promised. You haven't got it yet. But you expect it to come. That is what hope is. And you need to abound in hope. And you can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, is this prayer thing. See, there are two things you will never escape from in this Christian walk. Three, really. You know, the blood, the word, and the spirit. But let me just put the blood on one side for now. Because the blood is just to clean your heart so that the life and the power can flow. The word and the spirit. Whenever you see your failing either in fear, doubt, hope, and everything is looking something, go back to the word. Go back to prayer. That's where the faith and the hope will come from. And when you begin to see, you know, and, and our greatest hope is Christ in us, the hope of glory. The hope of the manifestation of the sons of God. There are a lot of other hopes you know, maybe you're hoping for money, you're hoping for this, you're hoping for that, and that, there's nothing wrong with those. But the hope of all hopes is Christ. You know why? In that there is everything. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you learn to, to abound in that hope, it will be easy for you to have hope in a lot of other things. See, a lot of people, they're, they're, they're trying to hope for one material thing or the other. And when that one doesn't come to pass, hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
You know, they're praying for, for X, Y, and Z. Maybe this one is praying for a life partner. Or this one is praying for healing. Or this one is praying for uh, 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 fruit of the womb. And when it doesn't come, they now gets discouraged. And then they don't, they don't want to seek God anymore. You know, the, the heart becomes sick. God has told you the answer here. Abounding up. So, okay, even if that one hasn't come to pass, this one that I'm looking at, what God has promised, Christ in me, that's the most important one. When I have that one, I have the other one. So I'm not going to allow these other ones to distract me. Stand to your feet. Are you listening to me? Put the power of the Holy Ghost. The same way you are bound in faith is the same way you are bound in hope. The Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. You know, I, I shared this in church recently. And um, I'm going to repeat it. I, I said it, I think, last week, you know, recently. You know, and I said it as a kind of uh, example and instruction. You know, every day, I, as I'm praying in the Spirit, I look at, there are some certain scriptures I look at every day. What am I doing? I'm abounding in hope. Scriptures, you know, arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. You know, um, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that we might grow up into him in all things. I look at those, and it gives me, it keeps the, my hope very strong. And they're not manifested yet, some of them, but I know you know, you will lend unto nations and you will not borrow. You will be head and not tail. You will be above only and not beneath. The wicked one toucheth him not. These are, uh, uh, the, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit will raise a stand against it. I look at them daily. So I'm abounding in hope. I'm abounding in faith. So when I read the newspaper about Nigeria, and hear this, that the, foreign, uh, the, the exchange rate is now 535 to 1 naira. And, and, and uh, uh, 535 to 1 dollar. Someone's just laughing. And, and, and uh, you want, because that hope is strong, I push it and I say, yes, it may be, that, that's a fact, but we're going to change it. Amen? Because God is not going to leave Nigeria in a lurch. Why? Because of you and I. He said, if I can find 10 people there, I'll preserve the place. We are more than 10. Let's give the Lord a clap offering somebody. Let's talk to God. Let's talk to God. Let's talk to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's talk to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Let's talk to God. Today, uh, we're going to um, continue in Romans chapter 15. In our last lesson, I believe we, we stopped about verse 12. And um, basically what uh, uh, Paul was saying in this portion of scripture uh, was the fact that God had a plan for the Gentiles. And I said last week that the plan for the Gentiles was not an afterthought. It was, it was an intrinsic part of God's program. God decided in his wisdom, and you know, he still does the same thing today. When God was going to come back into the earth, he looked for a righteous line. A person, you see, Adam and Eve had fallen. The original plan was that Adam and Eve were created, then they would have children, they would eat of the tree of life and those children will repopulate the earth and fill the earth with righteousness. Uh, I, I shared this on, on, on Wednesday, you know, you go to Genesis 26, it says be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, you know. So that was the original plan. That plan failed, not because of God, but because of man. So God now kicked in a second plan and said that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. Then he began to look through the years, you know, for a, 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 a set of people who, through whom he could bring the Messiah. 
And that's why we get all the genealogies we see in the, in the Old Testament, you know, from Adam, Seth, then you had, you know, Methuselah, then Enoch, and then, you know, he went down through the line. Of, finally, anyway, he got a man called Abraham, uh, who he set apart, took him away from his people, revealed himself to him. Abraham began to serve the true God, and then he now... Uh, made him a promise of a child, of a son. And the son came after 100 years, approximately. Then about 10, 15 years later, he asked him to go sacrifice the son. And Abraham obeyed in faith, having the... And that's where, why, why faith comes by hearing, but it grows by acting on God's word. See, no matter how much of God's theory what I have in my heart, it gives me faith. But that faith will not grow until I act on it. When I act on it, then I have results. Then those results now all, and then my faith grows. So Abraham could look back and say, look, this is God who took me from Ur of the Chaldees. He brought me here. He's made me rich. You know, because Bible says Abraham was very rich in gold and silver. And, you know, he helped me to conquer these people. He's doing the... It, it, and then he finally gave me this son supernatural at the age of 99 100 years old uh, if he kills the boy he will have to raise him from the dead the bible says in the book of hebrews that abraham received him in a figure he he thought it through and you know you and i need to do the same thing you know when we when we when we're faced with all kinds of challenges and there are lots of challenges we're facing you know particularly in these perilous times it's so easy if you take your eye off the ball, so to speak, to become discouraged. But what you just need to do is to look back into your life and see where God brought you from. And then it's not difficult for you to say, if, if he wants the Isaac, let him take it. <laughs> he will raise him from the dead. Glory be to God. And so, the, and then he now said, because you've done this, we saw this last time, Genesis 22, he said, in blessing will I bless and multiply, and in they shall all the nations be blessed so the blessing was not restricted to the biological line of abraham which are the jews you know it was to be uh distributed it was to spread to all the nations however albeit through abraham and that's exactly what happened you know uh, down through the centuries and the millennia uh, God faithfully watched over his word to perform it until finally he could bring the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through uh, Joseph and Mary. And then finally, you know, uh, uh, um, the salvation for all of humanity. But it came through the Jews. Jesus himself said it this way. He said, salvation is of the Jews. He said, you don't know what you worship. Talking about the Gentiles. He said, you know, salvation is of the Jews. It's very um, um, uh, instructive to note this. All the scriptures are Jewish. Except one, which is Luke. Which is, uh, is also Jewish because Luke was a disciple of Paul. You know, really, you know, strictly speaking, it's all Jewish. All the prophets were Jewish. The Lord Jesus Christ is Jewish. You know, however, the blessing is not restricted to the Jews. It's supposed to spread to all Gentiles, but through the Jews. And Paul makes it very clear in this same epistle. We read that, we, we studied that earlier on many months ago, where he said to the Jew first, but not only, but to the Jew first. And it's very important as a Christian you realize that many Christians uh, 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 don't seem to appreciate the Jewish roots of our faith. Everything we have, you know, has a Jewish root because salvation is of the Jews. You know, and that's why we need to study the scriptures to understand, you know, God's uh, plan through the Jews uh, for the whole of humanity. And so we saw all of that. And then we stopped in verse 13, which is the God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I, I shared this truth, that the fact that, you know, um, 
your hope should always be abounding. What is hope? Hope is a uh, positive expectation of what God has promised that has not yet come into physical manifestation. So it's still futuristic in the sense that it's going to come to pass sometime in the future. But you have a uh, uh, um, uh, positive expectation of that uh, reality. That positive expectation is what we call hope. And uh, it's crucial for the Christian life. You know, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I mentioned this last time. I will probably expand it today. You know, that the hope of all hopes is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, if we're well taught, sadly, in many, many cases, we're not well taught and it's not, uh, we're not properly instructed. Christians should be taught that in this lifetime, God's purpose for you is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That expectation of the, the growing up into Christ in all of his fullness becomes your hope. I know in many Christian circles, we take the hope to be the rapture, which is not wrong. It's also, there's also the hope of heaven, the hope of the rapture, you know. But uh, um, um, this hope of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is for this life. The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. And, and, and if you don't have that hope, you know, um, when you're disappointed in other things, it can get you so discouraged you know, and, and you don't press on. But when you have the hope of the perfection of Christ uh, in you uh, in this lifetime, and then as a consequence of that also, the hope of the rapture, that one day, you know, when Jesus comes back, you're going to be uh, taken up together with him in heaven, and you're going to go to heaven. It gives you strength to face anything. It doesn't matter what you face. Your future is secure. And that gives you strength to press in and press through the temporal problems and afflictions of this life. When you don't have hope, it, you know, it's so easy to get uh, uh, discouraged and even, God forbid, to even go off the faith completely. And, and, and that's why the issue of hope is so important and he tells us here how to do it he says now the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing and i mentioned this last time how do you know you're believing when there's joy and peace when there's fear and doubt you're not believing and i mentioned this last time uh you have to pray yourself into this position because there are all kinds of things that come against your mind you know, all kinds of fears and doubts and all of that. The Bible says, perfect love casteth out. The word casteth out is a very, is a very uh, instructive word. It means that fear is trying to come in. And then the perfect love that is inside you is pushing against it. And that's why it's casting it out. And uh, I said this also. You know, it doesn't only just cast it out. It keeps it out. And this is true of peace and joy. You have to pray. That's why you, you should pray. And it tells you how to say it, through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you pray in tongues and you pray with groanings and all of that, you know, with the, with the, with the Word of God and the life of God, what happens is that the, 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 the power of the Holy Spirit from your inner man, you know, from the innermost being, you know, the Bible calls the heart here, goes up here into the mind, the will, and the emotions and casts out fear. And then it establishes peace and joy in the mind, the will, and the emotions. And then you maintain it. It's not just something you just get once. You have to maintain it. So you have joy and peace in believing. You know, so when, when something is, hasn't yet come to pass, you know, there's a peace. The Bible says in quietness and in confidence shall your strength be. There's a, there's a joy. There's a peace. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, and it keeps you... It keeps you, as it were, you know, afloat, so to speak, you know, spiritually. And it doesn't matter what 
the um, circumstances are, you're able to uh, uh, keep that vision of God's word, you know, in front of you, in spite of the fact that the physical manifestation has not yet come. You know, I think uh, one great disservice that was uh, done in, in a lot of the people who taught the faith message, not the fathers, the fathers actually taught it. When I look back at my own uh, personal experience, if I look at people like Brother Hagen and uh, uh, Dr. Yonge Cho, who just uh, died last week, I actually mentioned this on Wednesday, and I will uh, do a, just a short tribute again to him uh, during the announcements, you know, um, uh, and, and Kenneth Copeland. All of them taught the vital importance of praying in the Spirit. The only problem was probably they didn't just say that you needed to do it anytime you were believing for a particular thing but uh, they, they taught it <laughs> you know you can't really escape it you, you can't you can't hear kenneth hagan or you can't hear young Cho, or you can't hear uh, kenneth copeland or any of these guys and they won't talk about you know praying a lot in tongues why because it's the pray the power of the holy spirit is the praying in tongues that will push the f- doubt and push the fear out. And the reason why a lot of our Christians today are weak in faith and they're full of fear and doubt is because they try and exercise faith by just confession of the word and standing on faith, but they don't put, they don't emphasize and practice, uh, you know, uh, with any great consistency, the praying in the spirit. And if you do the praying spirit, then the power of the Holy Spirit is not there. And then fear and doubt, you know, and that's why, you know, they, 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 they are afraid and they doubt and then they get into gimmicks and they try and use all kinds of man means methods. But if you do a lot of praying in the spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit will be there to push out the fear and the doubt, casteth out fear, you know, and, 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 and establish peace and joy in your heart in in your believing and that's how it's, it's a good barometer you know uh, am i am i uh, 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 uh do i have joy and peace if you don't pray more when i say pray now i'm not saying ask god for the same thing over and over again i'm saying pray more in tongues and we travail with the life and the power of god in sufficient measure in your heart pray more until that joy and peace is established in your heart. And when it is there, then you maintain it. Not only do you get there, you also maintain it by constantly praying in the Spirit. You, you, you can now understand the instructions that God gave us by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. One particular one that comes to my mind now in this context is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. You know, it says, you know, from verse 12, it says, Rest not against flesh and blood, verse 11, you know, but against principalities and powers. You know, these are these wicked spirits, you know, that try, trying to rob you of your peace and your joy and the manifestation of the promises of God in your life. So he now instructs us to put on the whole armor of God, which very briefly I'll just summarize as daily put on all of the fruit of the spirit. In other words, you know, ask for all of that and the life of God. Then, you know, and say, take the word of God, which is so spirit, praying always. Everybody shout always. I, I don't know what's wrong with us. You know, we read those scriptures and then we ignore it in practice. How many Christians do you know that pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit? Very few, even you yourself. You pray sometimes, but you pray always. What Now, practically, what does that mean? For example, I'm talking to you now, so I'm not praying in tongues now. So it cannot mean... 24 7 praying in tongues that's not what it means what it means is this and i've taught this many times over the years what it means is that daily you know you need to have a time of concentrated prayer in the spirit at least an hour or two and and that's why god has uh, created that platform good morning jesus for us to be able to have an avenue to practice that you know in a collective environment uh, when one put a thousand to flight two put ten thousand to flight with an open heaven because by the grace of god we the leaders we pray about the meeting so that you can have an open heaven so 
that, 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 you know, that's an hour. Then you maybe have another hour for yourself personally after you've done that, you know. So that's that. Then throughout the day, frequently, once every six hours, according to the scripture, I didn't write the Bible, you know. Uh, the Bible says you shall talk of them, of God's word, but in the New Testament, that will also include praying in tongues. So for instance, when you say, uh, 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 Lord have mercy on me, I receive your blood to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I love God more with all my heart, will, mind, emotions and strength, which is the commandment. This is the great commandment of the law. And I love my brethren and all men more as Christ loves them. But I don't stop there. I now add tongues. I now pray in the spirit concerning that confession. So I do that once every six hours. Then in between those six hours, I also do it frequently anytime I am prompted by the Holy Spirit or I have the opportunity. When you do that, then you're praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. But if you do anything less than that, you're not praying always. Even if you just even do the one hour in the morning and then you don't do it, you don't pray again during the day, you're not doing it always according to the Scripture. The Scripture is very clear. The instruction is clear. Praying always. Always, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And it's very specific. Not just prayer, but in the spirit. That is in tongues and in groanings. You know, watching there the world perseverance and supplication for all saints. I'm going to be um, sh- preaching a message on this. Not today, you know, maybe next week or some other time when the Holy Spirit directs me. You know, I have a, I have a message. I preached it before some years ago but i've got some new dimensions of it of united praying in the spirit one of the most powerful weapons at our disposal is praying in tongues but sadly and regrettably we don't use it properly even where we use it we use it carelessly or we we, because we don't we don't obey the instruction the instruction is clear i cannot pray effectively in the spirit watch this if i don't put on the whole armor of god Observe. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Then he said, put on the whole. The whole means that you can put on part of it. Otherwise, you will not use the word whole. Whole means complete. And, you know, this revelation God gave me many years ago, 2005, somewhere in there, you know, when I was teaching on, you know, the, 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 the right hand of God. You know, it came by revelation as I was teaching, you know. And then I was able to flesh it out. I, yet not I, but the Spirit of God, the grace of God which is with me. You know, I was able to, you know, share that the, the whole armor of God is actually the fruit of the Spirit. You know why? God is love. So when I said the whole armor of God, I said the whole armor of love. But what is love? Love is, you know, God's character. And it has all those nine ingredients inside it. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, and patience. So, uh, when the Bible says put on the whole armor of God, he's telling you to put on, on a daily basis, you release those spiritual forces, which we taught a few weeks ago, you know, of joy, peace, every day. Every day. You, you release them from the spirit through the spoken word into the soul, mind, will, and emotions, and then you solidify them, so to speak, by praying in the spirit. So that's how you do it. And so the, it is it is when that is in place that the tongues and the groans will be effective. The apostle Paul tells us the same truth in First Corinthians chapter 13, where he says that though I speak with tongues of men of I don't have love. He said, I'm just a tinkling symbol. And sadly, that's what happens to a lot of, not all of it, but a great ma- amount of, 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 of praying in tongues that's done in the church. Because people are praying in tongues, but there's no love foundation. The tongues is not motivated by love. The tongues is not empowered by love. So it's not effective. The one that is going to be effective is that the tongues must have the foundation of of the armor of love the armor of god then the tongues will be effective then this thing that we're reading will become a reality you have all joy and peace in believing no wonder why the man said you know perfect love cast out where the word perfect there just means running its full course complete 
You see, the love of God is shared abroad in your spirit by the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, you're a child of God. Every child of God has the love of God inside him. But not every child of God is allowing the love of God to run its full course. The love of God is not being perfect. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But you must not take that love from the Spirit. You must put it in the mind, the will, and the emotion. That's why you need the Word of God. Tongues will not put the Word of God in your mind. You need the physical, you need the written word to know what, how God thinks, to know how God behaves. You know, uh, that, that's why the, the wisdom is the principal part of love. You need the wisdom of God's word. See, you know, you, ha- you have to have that. Then after that, you now pray in tongues. You now, the tongues will now take the power of God into the mind, the will, the emotions the body and the circumstances so that you can behave like God would in the different circumstances and situation which you come in. When you do that, then the love of God is being perfected. Then it's running its full course. You know, and it's something you're supposed to be doing throughout every day. Every day, it should, the love of God should be coming more into your spirit by having more of the life of God inside it. You know, then more of the word of God in your mind, your will and your emotions. You know, then more of the love of God uh, in your mind, you know, so that you can understand your will, your determination. Then, as you pray in tongues, it now goes to the emotions and into the body and into the circumstances so that you can behave like God. That is perfecting the love of God. You don't have to be perfect to perfect the love of God. Perfect just means to run its full course. And the more, as you do that, then gradually you as a person now becomes perfected. See, God didn't ask us to do what cannot be done. So when we do it like that, then we will have joy and peace in believing. And we will abound in hope. The word abound means to increase in hope. You know, as you pray in this kind of way, the promises of God that are not yet manifest in your life become brighter and brighter and brighter in your mind, in your thinking. And even though it hasn't happened yet, you are so confident it's going to happen. You walk around with a buoyancy. You walk around with a, you know, um, 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 with with a with a with a, with a confidence, a, an expectation. That's what hope is. A strong expectation. Let me let me use a natural illustration that people can identify with, you know, because. <laughs> Well, we're, we're quite a little bit money-minded, which is all right <laughs> to some degree. You know, if a very wealthy person was to come to you, maybe you're in some financial uh, difficulty, you know, and uh, a person of means that you know he has the money, he can do it, comes to you and says to you, don't worry about that thing anymore. You know, here is a check for 10 million. Let me just use it. You know, but today is Sunday, so you can't get the money today. (laughs) But you're going to get it tomorrow. The way you will leave church is different from the way you came in. Why? All of a sudden, you you know, maybe you had some, uh, some debtors, you know, uh, 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 creditors. You had some obligations to meet. All that is a weight gone off your mind. Because you, even though you haven't got the physical money yet, you have a promise. Give the Lord a clap offering somebody. Based, watch this, on the integrity of that person. That the person didn't lie. Number one. Number two, that the person has the means. So you know that when you present that check in the bank tomorrow, you know, it's going to be, it's going to become cash instantly. In fact, you will start phoning people <laughs> who maybe you are, you, you, maybe you are owing some money or you some creditors and say, oh, incidentally, don't worry, tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, you know, <laughs> you know, this will be done. How, what, how can you do that with such, ex- that's hope, expectation? Because you know who has told you that, that they're going to give you that money. Not only have they told you, they've even given you, you have the check is actually in your hand. But watch this the money is not yet there. 
But you trust in the integrity and the ability of the person. And that is what gives you that um, confidence, that that expectation. That's what really hope, that's what hope is. In our case now, the, 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 the check is the word of God. God has said it. Then God has the ability. So I know he's going to watch over his word to perform it. So I now walk around with the confidence. So I bound in hope. So, and you see, the more I pray in the spirit, the, 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 the more uh, the reality of what God has promised shines in my mind. And the more I know the power to bring it to come to pass is being released. So I am more confident. So I'm abounding in hope. Hope is a confident expectation of good. Confident expectation. It's not happened yet, but it's an expectation. You know, I shared with us recently in church here something I've been practicing, you know, and I I shared it deliberately so that you know you can also practice it. That there are certain scriptures I look at every day, like Isaiah 60. You know, um, uh, you know, arise and shine for thy light is come. You know, kings will come to the brightness of thy rising. You know, <clears throat> your sons and daughters will be brought afar. You know, your heart will be enlarged. You know, they will gather themselves unto you. You know, unto you will be brought the abundance of, of, of the seas shall be converted unto you. And the wealth of the Gentiles shall come unto you. Today, that truth is much more real to me than it was a month ago because i look at it every day it's brighter to me i am i have a confident expectation that that truth is going to come to pass in my life why because one i believe it two i pray in the, i are bound by the power of the because i'm praying the spirit all the time i'm doing by the grace I yet not I by the grace of God which is with me I I pray without ceasing literally I do there's no time you see me I'm not praying about something you know I get up early in the morning I pray for my wife I pray for my children you know that's my priority you know I pray for myself then after that I I, I pray for like for example today now I pray for the services <clears throat> you know this this particular service I prayed yesterday I prayed on Friday but my Sunday services, I'm just saying this now, you know, for the benefit of pastors, you know. I don't start praying for Sunday services on Sunday. I'll do one hour of prayer on Friday. So that you will come to church. <laughs> I discovered it over many years ago. You don't pray, you just find the people won't come. Not because they don't want to come. He gets up on Sunday, the tire of his car goes flat. Or something happens. So when we pray in the spirit, God, Holy Spirit goes ahead with the angels of God to begin to work on the lives and the circumstances of the people so that they can bring them. But if you pray on Sunday, you're too late. That's how I learned it by experience. You know, when we first started scripture, Pastor, I can never forget. You know, in those first early years, when we're in Bo Janshana school, if I don't pray, the attendance drops. Then when I pray, ah, then I notice it was a pattern. Then the Holy Spirit then explained to me what was happening. You know, when you pray, the people will come. Watch this. Not only the people will come, the right people will come. Because there were some people God may not even want to come. Especially if they will cause problem for you. You know Why? I, I, I didn't plan to say this, but I'm going to say it. Some people create a good spiritual atmosphere. Others don't. And when they create a good spiritual atmosphere, the word can flow, faith can flow, miracles can flow. Whereas, if you have people who come with an, with an attitude of pride, rebellion, unbelief, and all of that, they can hinder the spiritual atmosphere. How did I learn this? I learned all of it by practice. You can't read it in a book. 
You have to practice. Pray. Pray. Praying is like driving. You learn to drive by driving. You learn to pray by praying. No matter how much theory you know, if you don't actually pray, you won't know. So, through prayer, you know, we're able to abound by the power of the Holy Spirit in hope. So, when I look at those scriptures, you know, I'm going to be preaching today, you know, on a um, prophetic, uh, present truth pro- uh, prosperity message. You know, and Pastor Wally has preempted me. He went ahead and in the in the in the in the daily rhema for two days now he, he first of all talked about the power to get well then today he talked about zion city prosperity well that's not what i'm going to preach <laughs> it's part of it he actually got it it's going to be it's actually a part of all of that but it's going to come in a different in a slightly different manner you know but the the the, the point is this you know when i look at some of those scriptures like this Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, I shared this recently in church, where it says they will build the old waste places. It gives me hope for Nigeria. You know, you know, the, the Nigerian, the Nigerian economy has been destroyed through corruption over many, many years. Those of us who grew up in Nigeria in the 60s, I was in we, we, we travel to go and see our grandchildren, you know, uh, with Dara and William, you know, uh, and they had moved. They've moved from California. They're now in New Jersey, you know, nice, very nice area where they live. So as we were driving through the neighborhood one day, I think I said this to my wife and, and Dara. I said, ah, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Ikoi in the 1960s. Us. Yeah. We moved into Ikoi in 1966. My my mother, you know, was a was a was a was a officer in the. This was before Lagos State. Lagos State was uh, created in 1967. So she was working for the Federal Ministry of Justice. You know, so they gave her a flat in Ikoi. That was where I grew up, between my the age of nine to when I went to university when I was 15 years old. You know, I can never forget it. Ikoi was so, it was so quiet. You could go and sit on the road for 20 minutes. No car will pass. All the lawns, all the grass was long, was, was mowed. You know, everything was green. You know, it was so safe. It was so safe. It was the 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 the, 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 the uh, atmosphere, the um, um, how, how shall I call it? You know, uh, it was beautiful. I still remember. I, I, as we were driving through, you know, I said, "Wow!" I said, "This is exactly how Ikoi was when I was a kid." All the lawns mowed. The place was nice. It was quiet and all of that. We used to have this thing. Um, there's this ice cream car. I still remember, you know. So and, and they would drive. They would and, and they would start ding da 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 da. Then you know the ice cream man is coming. Then you go out, you know, and you will buy ice cream. You know, it was so it was so nice. I used to order my comics. Things like B- Buster and and uh, uh, all these Marvel comics, you know, uh, the Avengers and and Mighty Thor and and Iron Man and all of this. They used to bring it to my house. We just order for it and bring it to your house. It was so. What, 66, 67, 68, 67. The, the Civil War began. You know, 68, 69, 1970. It was still like that to some degree. 71, 72, 70, things started changing. Things started changing. I went to CMS Grammar School. And for those who went to secondary school in the 60s, 
and in the 70s. I appreciate it. Pastor Quake is my wife will appreciate what I'm saying. You understand? I, can't. I did 15 subjects in Form 1. 15. 14, 15, because we did woodwork. You know, we did all kinds of things. But the point I want to make is this. I still remember in Form 1, when I was in year one in, in secondary school, I had so many books. My books were like I had a dictionary, I had atlas, I had books on Greek mythology, you know, Hercules and all of this. You know, we had we, our education was so good. We had books on history, English history, and all of that. Sick books like that. I was in for one. So you had to put all your books inside your locker and everything. You know, I, I'm talking about secondary school. I'm not talking about university. That was how good the Nigerian education system was. You know, we thank God for the legacy of Obafemi Oh Lord. Give the Lord a clap offering, somebody. You know, what those men, what those men did, you know, and how much was the school fees? I was paying, I still remember slightly, about um, maybe a hundred pounds a year. Something like that. It was about 30 pounds for each term that my parents were paying. But the quality of the education that we got was so high. In Form 3, when we started physics, chemistry, and biology, my, in my school, in CMS Grammar School, still there, we had a, uh, a four-story laboratory. The first, la- the first uh, level was, uh, 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 I think it was biology. The second level was chemistry. And then the third one, I think, was physics, if I remember rightly. You know? But what I remember was that in, in, in the chemistry lab and the biology lab, we had all kinds of things. You know, they were putting formalin, things like frogs and all of that kind of, you know, skeletons, everything, you know. It wasn't... And then, you know, when it came to, in, in, in chemistry, we could uh, use, uh, uh, I had my own corner. Each student with my burette, my pipette, or, you know, my conical flask, everybody, individually. In university, they don't have it now. Good news. You shall build the ancient places. God is going to build the ancient, the, 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 the desolations of many generations. So I, I just use that as an example. But it's hope. You are bound in hope through prayer and intercession. Let's just look at a few more scriptures. Look at verse 14. So you need to abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, and I myself also I'm persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. The word knowledge there is uh, is epignosis. <coughs> you know, that's correct. No, no, no. This this particular one is not epignosis. This one's this is this is gnosis. You know, I just quickly checked the Greek. It says, nevertheless, brethren. I have written unto you the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace of God which is given unto me. In other words, you, 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 you have some knowledge, but I have also written to you to give you more knowledge. That's why that word is not epignosis, actually gnosis. You know, I can understand the context now. Uh, and Paul said, look, uh, you guys are, you, you, you know, you help one of you know you have some knowledge and I'm giving you more knowledge because of the grace upon me as an apostle. That I should be, I didn't hear you, the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles or to the nations, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. He's talking about the prayers that the Gentiles offer up. And he was using the uh, analogy of 
the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you know, they will kill animals and then they will burn it on the, burnt, on, on the altar of burnt offering and it will rise up as a sweet smelling savour. But in the New Testament, we don't kill animals. It's our worship and our prayers and our tongues that rise up and it's accepted by God because it's sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. He says, I have therefore, I didn't hear you, wherefore I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. In other words, I'm not going to be talking about what God has not done through me. I'm going to be talking about what God has actually done through me. Uh, 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 and we have to understand something, brethren. Paul had a special ministry and assignment to the Gentiles. Very, very important to understand this. I actually have this in my notes here, and I would like to um, emphasize uh, 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 this. Uh, go with me to... We're going to come back to... to okay, no, let, let, let's finish this and we'll go there. It says, verse 19, Through mighty signs and wonders... I didn't hear you. By the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build another man's foundation. So I didn't go to where Peter and others had gone. I went to virgin territory where they had never heard before. I went, I didn't, I didn't go and build another man's foundation. But as it is written, I didn't hear you. To whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. Now let me stop there. You know, this man, Paul, had a special ministry to the Gentiles at that time. And I'm going to explain to you uh, why God prepared watch this he prepared and then he chose paul and the reason why i'm going to show it to you is because he's doing the same thing for, for to us today in our own generation there's nothing you're going through in your life that is not a part of your preparation watch this your birth is a preparation before i formed you in my, your mother's womb i knew you and i ordained you not now to be a prophet, but to be conformed to the image of Jesus, which is true for all of us. Your, your, your background, your training, your education, everything, nothing was by accident. It's all a part of preparation to be able to fulfill your divine destiny as well as your divine assignment. They're interwoven. If you fulfill your destiny, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus, you will automatically fulfill your assignment because you will have the equipment to do it. If you don't fulfill your destiny to be conformed to the image of Jesus, there will be parts of your assignment you will not be able to fulfill. This man called Paul was chosen by God. He said, God who separated me from my mother's womb. But you know, when we read those things, we think, oh, that's special for Paul. It's true for all of us. It's true. You see, the, the, the thing is, Christianity by the, you know, has not been taught in its purity and fullness. We've taught a very watered-down version of Christianity. Let me talk about this man. Look at Acts chapter 9. Now we can go there. Acts chapter 9, uh, I will look at verse 15. There are many other verses, you know, throughout the New Testament, but I'm just going to look at, you know, this when, when Paul got born again, and Ananias, you know, God told him to go and meet him. God said, but Ananias told God, said, God, you don't know this man. He's been arresting us, you know, and, you know, he's putting them in jail and everything. So God said, mm, don't worry. He says, and the Lord said unto him, go thy way. For he is a what? Let me scream it out. Unto me to bear my name before 
the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So he had a threefold ministry. You know, he didn't only minister to the Gentiles. He ministered to the uh, aristocracy, you know, the, 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 the kings of his day. And then he also ministered to the children of Israel. Which really is the ministry of all of us. See, God is going to use you to minister to your own people. Then God can also use you to minister to kings, politicians, and those in authority. You know? And uh, this, this man uh, called Paul, he did a great job. Look at, uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. Look at Genesis, no, no, not Genesis, Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. And look at verses 7 and 8. He, Paul is, this is Paul writing himself. He said, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me to the apostleship. He doesn't use that expression. But to the apostle of the Gentiles. In other words, just like Peter had a a ministry to the to the Jews I had a ministry to the Gentiles now let me say a few things about this great man the Apostle Paul and God I want to say it in such a way as to relate it to us today so it's not just a, a theological abstract uh, phenomenon why did God choose Paul to minister to the Gentiles and choose Peter to minister to the Jews. I'm going to say something that was a little bit controversial, but it's not. When you think deeply about it, I'm going to explain to you in a minute. Actually, he chose both of them to do both. <laughs> the difference between Paul and Peter was this. Paul's birth, he was by by birth, he was a Roman citizen. He was not born in Jerusalem or born in Galilee like Peter. Even though he was Jewish. His two parents were Jewish. He was born in Tarsus. He was born as a Roman citizen. He was, you know, taught, he was a lawyer. He was taught all the things about, you know, of Jewish law and everything. So he knew all of that. But he was he was he was born in a in, in the Roman Empire, so he grew up with Gentiles. He understood the Roman culture. He understood, you know, Roman education because he had one. Now, that's why when he's writing the book of Acts, he says, as some of your poets would say, how did he know he was he read it in school? <sighs> His whole education, birth and background actually fitted him it fitted him it, it prepared him to be able to fulfill this assignment and that was why it was easier for paul and i use the word easier and i'm going to qualify that in a minute for paul to mix with the gentiles than it was for peter see peter was a fisherman you know, he was, he was born in, 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 in Israel. He was born in Galilee. He came from Bethsaida. You know? And he really had very little interaction with Gentiles when he was growing up. All he did, you know, was, he, he was, in, uh, was in Galilee there. You know, he, he had very little... He, he was educated in the sense that because all Jewish children were literate. They were taught to read and write. But he was not... He, he was literate, cor correction, but not educated like Paul. You know, well, Peter and James and John, they didn't go to university, but Paul did. So, when God was trying, when, watch this, when God spoke to Peter and James and John, when Jesus was raised from the dead, his mandate to them was not to the Jews only. It was to the Gentiles. He said it to them. He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. He, he never restricted them to the Jews. But watch this. The deficiency in their 
background and their education made it difficult for them, not impossible, I'm going to get there in a minute, to fulfill that mandate. Later on, they got to see it. For example, not like John, but later on in John's life, John reached out to the Gentiles. All those churches, Ephesus, you know, uh, uh, Smyrna, they're all Gentile churches. Initially, they had that restriction, but this is what I want to say to you, and this is where it applies to you and I today. Your birth background and education prepare you for a part of the assignment, observe the word part, that God has given to you. However, as you grow spiritually, if you grow, which is a big if, (laughs) sufficiently, as you grow spiritually to be conformed to the image of Jesus, and you begin to get what I have taught in recent times, when I say recent times, I think I taught this first of all in 2014, you know, the ability of the mind of Christ... You begin to imbibe the wisdom of God. All your natural uh, restrictions and limitations will be overcome. So that some of the assignment that you, 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 you you are not prepared naturally to be able to do, you will not be able to do it. And this was what Paul saw. And that's why he penned down, I'm going to close with these truths you know uh, christ in you the hope of glory let's go to colossians 1 and then we're going to go to ephesians and then the holy spirit will help me to close this this is so important paul saw beyond his nose he saw beyond his jewish roots he watch this he appreciated his jewish roots he cherished it it was paul that said to the jew first he said, what advantage have the Jews? He said, chiefly, in every way. Because they are custodians of the But he did not restrict himself to that. You and I, I have my own education. You have yours. You have your background. I have. There are certain things that you can do now, I can't do. Let me, let, let, let me rephrase that. There are certain things you can do better now than I can. Because your background you know, where you were born, the education you had, the people you know. So, if there are certain parts of assignment that will be fitted for you better than it will be for me. And there will be certain parts that will be better for me than it will be for you. But as we grow spiritually and we begin to attain the fullness of Christ, there is nothing you will not be able to do. And there is nothing I will not be able to do. I may not be able to do it initially first, but later on. And that's what happened to John. John was a fisherman. But he outgrew being a fisherman. Because John grew. He grew spiritually to become more and more like Jesus. By the, watch this, by the end of the century, that first century, Jesus died about 33 AD. Paul and others, you know, we're told that Paul must have died maybe about 66, AD 64, AD 66, when, when Nero killed him, you know. But by the end of the century, it was John who was the father of all the churches. It was John. He outgrew his limitations. He wrote, he wrote the gospel. Then he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. To the elect lady. All this chaos. They were all Gentiles. That initially they didn't want to even talk to. Peter said, God, you know that I can't go and see any Gentile. Then God said, what I have cleansed, you don't call it common go to the house of Cornelius. And they were shocked that God would baptize them. All those prejudices, they had to overcome. They did overcome them after a while. And, and, and the same thing with us. You see, so there, there will be limitations you have now. Now, let's look at Colossians 1 and uh, Ephesians 4 and we close. It says, To whom God, this is the hope of all hopes, will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, I would say, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Turn to your neighbor and say, What is the mystery of the gospel? I didn't hear you. Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. That's the mystery. What the word mystery just means secret. Next verse. So that you, we take it, you know, in its total entirety. He says, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man. That's what this word is individual. It's not just collective. That we may present every man, what? Perfect in Christ Jesus. This is the mystery of the gospel. As you as you attain this, as you grow into this, all your natural limitations get set aside. So, where initially you were restricted to what your natural birth, your natural education, your natural uh, this thing uh, um, uh, preparation limited, you know, fitted you better for. With time, you are able to overcome that. So you will not only do that, that, that one that you are fitted for, you start even doing beyond that. That's why Paul could do with the Gentiles, he could do the kings, and he could do the Gentiles. Which is the whole world. Which is what you and I are called to do. Particularly in this end time, we are called to take the gospel to every nook and corner. Every tribe, tongue, and kindred. Now I speak English and Yoruba to some degree. But with the ability of the mind of Christ that is coming and um, 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 incredible photographic memory, language learning ability, I'm able to just pick languages like that. So even places I can't go now, I'll be able to go then. Hallelujah. I didn't hear a very convincing amen. Uh, looking at me funny. Look at, uh, that's easy. No, no hope. <laughs> It's not clear. It's not uh, the vision is not clear in your mind. See, do you really believe you can become like Jesus? How clear is that hope in you? Look at Ephesians four. Although Pastor Laulu is going to talk about it again later on when we do the announcements, but let me steal his thunder, so to speak. You know, for the perfect of things, because of time, I'm not going to... Let me just jump to verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in some things. Do you believe that? Or is it just something Paul just said? You know, the world has not yet seen... I'm going to... I'm closing. What a man who has grown up into Christ in all things look like. We haven't seen it. The Bible says, eye has not seen. <laughs> Ear has not heard. Neither has it entered. The things God has prepared for them that love him. The Bible says, and this is to fire you up. It fires me up. And I want to trust God that it's firing you up. You know what the Bible says? It says the whole creation is groaning and travailing waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's something that has never been seen before. You know, the Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, that was seen in Palestine 2,000 years ago was the Son of God the physical son of Mary and Joseph. He was a carpenter by profession. The first 30 years of his life was lived in obscurity. It was those last three and a half years that he manifested as the son of God. And the great things he did are recorded in the four gospels. But this same Jesus tells us that the works that he did, a company of his followers are going to not only do it, but they're going to do greater works. They will not be restricted to Palestine like he was. And for a reason. Because he just came to do his job of redemption and then went back to his father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. In order to be restricted to Palestine, 
they're not going to be just carpenters like he was. They're going to be doctors and engineers and, 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 and economists. And, and the world would never, Wally, they will never have seen anything like it. That's what's about to burst forth now. The glory of God. I got to go. I, I, I can keep you here for an hour. Just, just telling you what is coming. You know, but I, I'm going to summarize it and close with this statement. You know what the Bible says? It says in Isaiah 25, speaking prophetically. He said, when it happens, they'll say, this is our God. We have waited for him. Stand to your feet. The world has not seen. Nobody has, nobody has seen what it means to grow up into Christ in all things. And you know what the same apostle says? I, I, used, I, I shared this many, many years ago. You know, in, 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 in the scripture pastor, and then we took it to, to life fort for the children. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is he lying? And we said, there is nothing I cannot learn and I cannot master. I can do it. In, in, if you go to life fort, both high school and junior school, you see there. I can do all things. There is nothing, there is no such thing I, I cannot learn maths. Or I cannot learn physics. Or I cannot learn uh, engineering. Or I cannot learn biology. There is nothing. There is nothing. I can do. Everybody open your mouth. All things. I can do maths. I can do physics. I can do art. I can do geology. I can do geography. I can do history. I can do literature. I can do uh, uh, law. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Give the Lord a clap offering. When that reality begins to come to manifestation, there is no part of your assignment you cannot do. You can go to Kings. To, this week you can be in Buckingham Palace. Yes! Or in the White House. Nothing will intimidate you in this life. You, because you are a master. And you can take the gospel to kill. Paul was not intimidated by Agrippa. He was not intimidated by Festus. Or Felix. He was not even intimidated by the emperor. You, this was a man who had a total education. Not just physical now. But spiritual. He knew who he was in Christ. He could stand before kings. And Jesus said, he said, I will send you to kings. He stood before the emperor and told him the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He stood before Felix. He stood before Agrippa. And you know, the Bible said, the way he spoke. You know what Festus said? He said, Paul, thou almost persuadest me. I will Agrippa. Ah, Paul. The first time he said, much learning. <laughs> In our own case, they won't say we are mad. They will say we are great. They will say, wow. Wow. So this is what Jesus can do. I too want to be like Jesus. Let's talk to God. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. We believe these words have empowered you to live a victorious, transcendent life in Christ. Our mission is to equip God's people for service and build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ.